Who are you? <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> Who are you? What, what are you doing here? First, I would like to just get to know you. Huzzah! Huzzah! <laughs> Bye, Imperial March. You are very menacing. Oh, uh, yes, indeed. Should we test this webcam since we haven't even done that yet? Yeah, we probably should. Yeah. Might as well. Hayden, Might as well. are you with us, buddy? Yes, I'm still trying to get Twitch to load here, but. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Hayden Blackman, Same ladies and Blackman, gentlemen. Hayden Blackman, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, the webcam works. Oh, my God, it works. Your hand looks amazing. I know. Uh, hi, Sam Whitworth here. David Collins. And uh, we got Hayden Blackman. Hayden Blackman, and we have music. Hello. Yeah, let's. So, you know, here's the thing. <laughs> we haven't done this in a while, so uh, getting this to work? Yeah, it's a nephew proposition, but I believe in us. I, I believe in us. I do too, and I think we should take this opportunity to. Uh, Thank Hayden Blackman for joining us. For those that don't know Hayden, he was the project lead on Force Unleashed. There he is, right there. There he is on, on the right. Yeah, far right. in that photo. Mm -hmm. And uh, so thanks, Hayden, for joining us after. And Sam, thank you for being so consistent in like, emailing Hayden every every month. Hey, Hayden, like, do you want to do it? Do you do when it, are we going to do this? What about now? Do you want to do it now? <laughs> do you want to do it now, Hayden? Or what now? <laughs> yeah. I'm really happy to be here. I mean, I'm super excited, so... When's the last time you even thought about this project, Hayden? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because uh, when it was re-released on Xbox Live, I downloaded it and played it. So that was what, like, maybe a year, year and a half ago. Uh, and then a couple weeks ago, um, I was going back through the cinematic script, um, just kind of rereading it for uh, another thing I'm working on is to kind of remind myself of how I pulled that thing together. Right. Um, <laughs> and I, I reread that and I reread TFU too. So um, pretty recently, you know, and I, I don't think there's a week that goes by that I don't think about it because it was such a important part of my, you know, career and one of the most challenging things I've ever done, most rewarding too, you know. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations yeah. on Mafia 3 for Dude. those of you oh, that had played it. Mafia 3. Good stuff, Mafia 3. Hayden Thanks. Blackman and everyone at Hangar 13 Games. Uh, Hayden was a project lead on Mafia 3. But at LucasArts, you... Well, first of all, even beyond LucasArts, right? Uh, Force Unleashed, um, Force Unleashed 2. I mean, you you wrote that. You had to write that so fast. In, two and, weeks, right? In, like two weeks. <laughs> um, Battle for Naboo, I think. Uh, Starfighter or Galaxies. You worked on so much stuff, not to mention all your comic yeah. book work. Uh, we were just talking about Darth Vader and the Ghost Prison that came up on social oh, media. I, a while by ago. the way, that's one of my favorites. Darth Vader and the Ghost Prison is I, is fantastic. I read it on your recommendation, actually. Really? Yeah. I was like, yeah. you know that guy Hayden Blackman that hired us for I, that stuff. I don't know him. Well, anyway, you should read this. Okay. Yes. Right. Oh, yeah. Hayden. You meant Hayden Blackman, right. not Hayden Christensen. Hayden Christensen. Yeah. That's no. right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, no. So uh, Hayden Blackman. Uh, Star Wars legend in comic books and video games. And, uh, <laughs> am I painting? Am I painting too thick a picture? Uh, <laughs> probably, but you know, right. I appreciate it. No such thing. No well, such thing. I, I don't. I thought. I don't know, Sam. This is your Twitch stream, but I, 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 I wanted to suggest that maybe we start by having Hayden tell us everything that we said wrong in the last two. Oh, sure. <laughs> because we would do these Twitch oh. developer streams, right? We would do, and <laughs> we would tell these stories, and then we get nice emails from you, Hayden, where you're like. Well, that's not what happened. That's not exactly that's not how it went. That's not from exactly how it happened at all. I don't remember any of those. I remember sending emails, but I don't remember what I actually pointed out. Uh, quite, a quite a bunch of stuff, and, and I think now I feel totally justified for trying to get you on this. Yeah, game. like, no. hey, hey, so, how about now? Why don't you prove it? Prove it, man. Prove yeah. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, to be f to be fair though, I think a lot of times it was like we would say I would probably in my audio role simplify something that was way more complex that actually happened. And sure. Hayden has the big picture because right. he's overseeing all disciplines hey, and he's like well that's not exactly right before we get totally deep into this just want to point out for subscribers of this fine twitch channel we have two uh prints this is one one is purple rain one is purple rain uh and then this is the other uh and so what's going to happen is at some point we are going to ask sign of the times that's right we're going to ask um uh trivia questions concerning force unleashed and subscribers, whoever answers the question first, we're going to send this off to you, and that's how that's going to go. Um, and also, I put in, uh, for the uh, subscribers, I put in the Force Unleashed 2 poster, which I don't think has been really seen very often by too many. It's the the one with 
Anyway. Have I it, seen this poster? I don't think you have. Oh. Well, maybe you have. So you haven't seen this version of it, though. Amy oh. Beth Christensen did this. Last week, I put in the Marvel Comics poster that she made, and then oh. this, this week, I put in a different poster that I don't think anyone's seen. Anyway, so, um, back to what we're doing, and let me see if I can get the game to work. Wouldn't that be great? Wow. Wouldn't that be great? Hayden, tell us, how, how did you come to work on space? It's a very incriminating picture right there. Oh, I know. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how did I come to work on? How did you come to? Uh, yeah, why are you here? How did you why start at Lucas here? Arts? I mean, yeah. and uh, leading up to the Force Unleashed, if you want to give a brief overview. Yeah, sure. So um, I was a creative writing major in college. Um, after I graduated, I started working at a literary agency. Wrote a couple books that got published. Uh, one on hauntings, one on monsters, and just saw an opening at um, Lucas Arts once uh, for a, a writer. And I, you know. I was a little bit worried about the publishing industry at the time because it was, you know, kind of on rocky ground, and I was interested in maybe making a career shift. And this was, you know, I was still young and had that opportunity, and um, uh, so I saw this opening for a, a writer at Lucas Arts, uh, and I had always been a huge gamer, and you know, thought that uh, it might be a good opportunity. The the interesting thing is that I didn't know very much about Star Wars beyond the films. You know, I I count Empire as one of my you know favorite all time films, but I hadn't read a lot of the books or the comics or anything like that. And um, the job was for writing for this interactive encyclopedia. So wow. <laughs> I had to like, you know, phone up on Star Wars pretty quick right. before I started, um, before I went in for the interview. But I got that, it was supposed to be a six month contract gig and it turned into, you know, 13 years at, at LucasArts doing, you know, writing, creative uh, direction, design work, um, being the liaison between Lucasfilm and, developers both internally and externally did some voice directing um, actually very surprised to hear that you didn't know much about star wars going in that's that's surprising to me yeah you know it was interesting and again it wasn't that i wasn't a fan I, you know i had action figures and obviously growing up and things like that but i just hadn't read beyond maybe the first thrawn trilogy book i hadn't read any of the expanded universe stuff and and i just really was a you know a fan of the films but not much beyond that and then I fell in love with the universe once I started because it was funny because when I first started working on this encyclopedia, so many people were like, oh, good luck. There's going to be so many conflicts and so much, you know, retcon stuff that you're going to have to do. And, and um, you know, there's so many discrepancies. And that actually wasn't the case at all. When I actually dug into it, it was a really cohesive universe. And the licensing guys had done such a great job kind of you know, keeping everything um, cohesive and making sure that there weren't a lot of contradictions. Um, and that, I think, kind of made me fall in love with the universe even more. Um, the the fact that, you know, it, it was so expansive, but it all still fit together. And mm -hmm. and then just seeing what so many other creators had added to it, I, I, I was floored. I was so, I was totally unaware that, you know, dozens of other writers and, and artists had added more lore to the universe. And so that, uh, that made me fall in love with it even more. And then when you start talking about, you know, going to different time periods and stuff like that, then it, it like the potential became limitless, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the, for, for working on Star Wars games. So, uh, yeah, it, it was, you know, in a lot of ways it was a dream come true job, just creatively, even if, you know, I don't know anybody that doesn't like Star Wars, right. But even if you, it, it wasn't your first passion, like the universe is so rich, you can do almost anything in it. Um, it was pretty amazing. Well, it's and to be fair too, at that time, what you started in ninety seven, ninety eight. Yeah, ninety seven. Yeah, I mean, there that was still really kind of towards the beginning of all the publishing. I think by ninety seven, they'd released maybe not even twenty books. I feel like. I mean, yeah, you know, I think I think the New Jedi Order had started by then. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was still kind of young, and so it's not like it is now. If for people that are listening, I mean, now there's just like a gluttony of stuff yeah. to catch up on. But back then, like the, the publishing program was really less than a decade old. I mean, it was really, what was it, 90 or 91 that was Heir to the Empire? I think it was 91. Um, yeah. But it, I mean, that's not a lot to catch up on. And it was only three movies at the time. But I remember you yeah. were on episode one, Insider's Guide, right? You did all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, we did. Um, Behind the Magic was the first thing, which was an interactive encyclopedia. Right. Um, and then for, you know, the entirety of the Star Wars universe. And then we did uh, episode one insider's guide right after that. But it was interesting, though, because the stuff that I discovered, you know, going in, we say there wasn't a lot written, but there were, it was so, it was very diverse, right? So there was, you know, there were the books, but then, like, I went through, I don't know, dozens of 
the original role playing game source books, right? And those were, you know, two hundred pages each and had so much lore and you know, do new data kind of introduced through that right. um, alone. Like there, there was this massive wealth of, of you know, kind of information that it, you had to dig for a little bit but once you found it, uh, you know, putting all that in an encyclopedia was great. And then that became the foundation for, uh, you know, kind of the, the ongoing um, uh, database that, you know, Lucasfilm used after that, which was pretty cool too. The Holocron. Yeah, the Holocron. The famous yeah. Holocron. Yeah, because <laughs> I remember you saying some really interesting stuff about, you know, because I remember the Tales of the Jedi comics and you talking about the Old Republic and, you know, the genesis of Knights of the Old Republic and, I mean, all kinds of Star Wars projects that you were involved in. And and this, what was your relationship like with licensing at that time? Because this is, you know, for those that are watching way before the story group that they have now, um, you know, but it was a different process at the time. Yeah, it was great. I mean, it, it was, it started out, there was only obviously a handful of people that we were working very closely with up there. And, um, you know, when we started working on any new project, um, I would kind of go in and after Insider's Guide, I had such a, you know, and Behind the Magic, I had such a comprehensive knowledge of, of Star Wars. By that point, I could kind of go in and say, well, these are the guidelines and these are the rules. Um, and then we would pull together a pitch and then we'd run that up through licensing just to make sure it wasn't conflicting with anything they were planning to do. But there, I don't ever remember there being any major pushback on anything we wanted to do really up until the day I left. I mean, you know, even with Force Unleashed, uh, you know, that was such a, in some ways could have been such a sensitive time period, you know, set between the, the two trilogies. Um, and we were given just so much freedom to tell the story that we wanted to tell. So um, it was fantastic. I mean, it, again, like I said, it was kind of a, a dream come true. Um, and then we got access to, you know, I mean, this was as a fan, this was really exciting, right? We were constantly getting access to things in development, right? So I'd get access to scripts that were being written, to, you know, for uh, Dark Horse comics or early drafts of novels or whatever, just so we could make sure that we were still, um, that we weren't doing anything to contradict something else that was being published somewhere else. Um, and also so that we could leverage it, you know, I mean, that's kind of how the, knowing what was going on with all the old Republic stuff at Dark Horse really spawned the idea to, you know, set Knights Old Republic in that time period. Um, That's amazing. And yeah, and, and being able to, you know, carve out a big chunk of that time period was really exciting too. Can you talk a little bit about the beginnings of Force Unleashed and pitching that? I, I mean, I remember there were videos that were released at the time. And you're kind of saving us here because Sam is trying to figure yeah. out, trying <laughs> this is to really like, reframe the game <laughs> here, which not, is showing up in the top left corner. Not easy. Um, it's not you know, easy. The, the, uh, the, um, the, the display setting that I have to use is not ideal. It's not being nice. No, no, no. Um, it's not. But I remember we put out some videos at the time um, talking about your pitch process with uh, with George and, and that whole thing with you and Peter Hirschman and Jim Ward and... Can you just talk a little bit about that experience? Because, you know, you were there. I think we tried to tell it secondhand, but, you know, since you're here, it'd be a treat to hear. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, um, and again, I read this quote a couple, a year or two ago. Actually, I, it's a quote from Gunnar Hansen, the guy that played Leatherface in uh, Texas Chainsaw. Right. Uh, I was reading his book and he said that, you know, every time you recall a memory you're actually recalling the last time you remembered that memory so over time you know the memories change right right um, and evolve right so um but yeah so i mean to the best of my recollection you know we kind of kicked it off in 2004 when jim ward took over lucas arts um a new kind of internal star wars project and we started with a really small team i mean it was maybe 10 people initially and started kicking around a ton of different ideas um, and generating just a, a massive amount of concept art with, you know, folks like Amy Beth, um, who, you know, you're seeing some of her concept art here on the stream, Greg Knight and a few others, um, Chris Voy, Chris Voy. Uh, you know, guys that have done just some phenomenal work over the years. Um, and we, we kind of hit a wide range of topics, right? So we, you know, pitched a bounty hunter game. We pitched uh, a, uh, or we pulled together a pitch for a bounty hunter game. We pulled together a pitch for like the first rebel a story about the first rebel, um, a game where you played as a, a kind of Wookiee warrior, uh, and a couple others. And we went up and, and met with George the first time and pitched him these five or six different concepts. Um, and it was really interesting because during the conversation, we, we kind of even, I think, you know, us on, on our end of the table, 
um, we were already kind of picking out elements from each of them that we liked and that we felt were stronger than others. Um, and the, the Wookiee one was funny because he, you know, um, we spent a lot of time talking about drama and how important drama is in games and, you know, the interaction between two characters. And then we pitched this Wookiee game where, you know, the main character uh, doesn't really Couldn't speak. talk. <laughs> yeah. uh, him away. What's happening in this scene? This is, uh, yeah. I, I just I just want to warn you I tried this in 1978 and yeah uh, right so, it, it didn't uh, go well yeah no I, I don't know if it created you know flashbacks to the to the Christmas special or what but the <laughs> <laughs> Christmas special the game the game yeah, yeah. yeah. I I want I want to uh, you guys are all like family I think Starship might be available we could yeah. uh, we sure. could hire them to do but uh, B Arthur is it that's the problem. Oh, right. We have a digital BR. Oh, oh, come good. on. Oh. Pretty good. No, she was better. Uh, At that time, I think she was. Sorry, hey, you, totally do You know, the thing that I think he liked, though, about it was this idea that you're kind of a, a superhero in the in the Star Wars universe. So we started talking about that a little bit. And then the formation of the Rebel Alliance in a game st set between, you know, episode uh, three and four, all those things kind of came out of that first meeting as being things that, you know, we had permission to go explore more. And, and then that kind of, we went through a couple other concepts in the meantime where we were, you know, before we fully embraced the idea of the force unleashed. Um, but uh, then that was the next big meeting with him was going in and saying, Hey, look, we want to create this game where we have these over the top force powers and playing the star fader seeker apprentice. And those were kind of the two big things to get greenlit. And, you know, I was concerned about them both. I didn't know how he was going to react. And when he saw the video for, uh, you know, this little previous video we had done showing these over the top force powers, he's like, yeah, that, that looks perfect for a video game. Go make that. Um, and there were no real issues with the, the storyline we were pitching other than, you know, he had some advice about make sure that there's, you know, a strong love interest and some other things. Because in the first draft, I don't even think we had Juno, for example. Um, it was much more of a... a uh, and it, it, so yeah, you know, it wasn't Star Killer and Proxy. Proxy, right. Proxy wasn't in the first. Proxy wasn't in the first draft either. Actually, the in the first draft, the Apprentice was much older, and he had been assigned to. Uh, oh no, he uh, yeah, he was much older, um, and originally had been assigned to like as like a bodyguard for like Leia, and then you know got uh, ambushed by some of Vader's forces, and then captured by Vader, and uh, you know so there was. It was a very different feel. And then we went back, based on some feedback in that meeting, we went back and we revised the story one more time. And then we sent him the story outline, um, just a hard copy of it, and then uh, got an – and this this tells you, like, kind of the timing of things, right? We got an approval on the story via fax. Right, <laughs> so, right, right. A fax. You, a got, fax, it, you got it right. faxed back. Because this was in 1987. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, we did this. And it was <laughs> printed out on <laughs> dot matrix printer with the little right. teeth on the side. That's you had to rip them off. Right. I, yeah. but I can remember it's all in Jim Ward. You know, it was me, Peter Hirschman, who was the VP of production at the time, and, and Jim Ward, who was the president of LucasArts. And we're all in Jim's office hovering on a fax machine waiting for the printout to come out to see what he commented on and whether or not we got approval on everything. And uh, that, um, you know, so, but we did. We got approval, and that was kind of mid 2005. And then we were off to the races. And from then, mostly just working with licensing on, on everything that we were doing. It'd be a horrible time to run out of toner. Oh God! You make, could you imagine you get an error at yeah. that time? And, I think it got jammed in the in the machine at one point. So, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> uh, that's funny. Well, do you remember? What do you remember about um, getting the cast together? Because I remember this as being a time where it was just like we had never done anything like this before in video games. I mean, traditionally it yeah. was you get the script, you you hold auditions, they get sent back to you. Back in the day, it used to get sent back to you on cassettes. Oh God! Dar, Dar used to have to hit, hit play. Is that what we <clears throat> just let it run? When, when I say we, I mean you guys, since I was not part of the. That was <laughs> a little get... before my time. That was more '90s. Okay. But I remember there so just being cassettes, cassettes and CDs of demos all over the place in yeah. the voice department. But then this well, was again, like, go ahead, yeah, sorry, Hayden. Well, at the time, you know, we were just doing voiceover, right? So we didn't yeah. care what the actors looked like. We didn't care whether you know how they emoted, in terms of their, you know. Uh, it, what their acting was beyond the, the kind of voice acting, right? So I think up until the Force Unleashed, every project I worked on, we we did just listen to basically voice auditions, and then with Force Unleashed, we knew we wanted to do likeness capture, um, and so that's where we really started looking at you know more traditional you know, you know television actors, could right? I, and, and we, yeah. I want to ask you a question about that. This is a question that we couldn't get the answer to from anyone, but really you. 
why likeness capture? Why was it important that the actors be the same people to provide the likeness and the voice? What what went into that decision that has you know certainly helped my career? <laughs> yeah, um, I, a lot of it came down to we thought it would improve the quality of the storytelling. Um, you know, we felt like we could do a better job with our cinematics um, if we had um, likeness capture. So, and and you know, we ended up doing it for all the major characters, right? So, um, you know, obviously the apprentice and then Juno um, and Coda, uh, not so much proxy, but uh, <laughs> yeah, Maris Brood, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, Maris Brood, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, I think we did it for Tom Kane as uh, as right. It was Tom, Tom as, as Captain Stern, and we did. Yep. Uh, I think we did Jerry and Monroe as the officer at the beginning of the game too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we yeah, did a, and then I think we know, got a bunch of the teammates in to do some stuff. Uh, I don't yeah. think we ever used it though. Well, so, you know, I mean, the funny thing, too, and we didn't see it here in the playthrough, but the in the Vader sequence at the beginning of the game, you know, the apprentice is the young boy is actually uh, one of our producers, Issa Stamos, who was yeah. her son. Yeah. Zeb, Zeb, so, Zeb Dries, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we wanted to, you know, again, we thought it would give it a layer of authenticity. And, you know, and I think part of us, too, we were looking at this as over time especially at once you know the story got traction and we pitched it to you know dark horse and and um i think what is del rey at random house camera who was the publisher of the novels at the time but as we were pitching it to all the other licensees and it was clear that everybody wanted to participate in this we really started thinking about it more and more like a you know a a film release in some respects right we you know if, if there weren't going to be you know new movies in the near future well, maybe the video games could become that, right? So, um, and at the so time, that was, I think, I think, another thing that factored into it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but at the time, I think we were all messaged that there were no more movies. This was going to be it. Like, yeah. that was it. Episode three, that's the end. Yeah. And now Star Wars is going to have to turn into more of a interactive property, a that's publishing right. property. Um, and so there well, was Well, George was retiring, correct? That was the whole thing. I don't, and I yeah, don't, I don't know. I mean, public. you know, I think there were all kinds of stories, right? And, 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 things going around, but I think what we knew or what we were told was, yeah, that, that, you know, at least for the short term, there wasn't going to be anything, you know, in terms of film or, um, you know, television was early on in the works, right? So there was, they were talking about the Clone Wars. Did and, you know about the Clone Wars? Because I, I don't know that I did. I don't know that I uh, had any idea that they were doing that. Yeah, we learned about, the, well, so we learned about the first series pretty early on because... Um, the Kennedy series? Yeah, because of stuff that we were doing internally. Um, I ended up writing some comics to tied into it and then um, for Dark Horse. So we did know about that pretty early on. Um, and in fact, one of the characters that um, I helped create, Dirge, ended up being, you know, who's a bounty hunter, ended up being a big figure in that. So there was a lot of back and forth there, which was cool. Um, and then early on, we kind of got brought into the loop on the animated series pretty early on too. Um, again, just so that we were all being consistent with our, you know, characterization of certain characters and where possible if we wanted to trade, you know, um, locations or introduce characters from, you know, the cartoon series and the games and stuff like that, we could. Um, I remember the, well, it was 2007 we went to Star Wars Celebration and we did our first panel about this. And that was also the same year that we did our first panel about the Clone Wars. Yeah. So that was kind of, I mean, we, we definitely knew about it. Although even at the time, I remember that panel, we didn't great. have anything to show yet. Right. I don't even think we had a trailer yet at that point. Mm -hmm. For TFU? For TFA, one, or TF, TFA, oh. see what I did? For the Force for Awakens. For TFU, yeah, we, yeah. Did not have a we did not have a trailer Awakens. for the Force Awakens in 2007, we which didn't. was, you know, unfortunate. Um, yeah. No, so for Force Unleashed, um, we did Star Wars Celebration in, at the LA Convention Center, and I think we just did a roundtable discussion. It was you. Mm-hmm. My first uh, Star I think it was, celebration. yeah, Matto and you, Hayden, and I was moderating, and Natalie Cox, and it was all concept art and talking about what we were going to do, mm -hmm. and that yeah. was May of 2007. Um, and I just remember, and maybe you can talk a little bit about this, Hayden. I remember that this was the most ambitious thing I had ever seen or heard. I mean, there was the digital molecular matter, there was euphoria yeah. there was likeness capture um i remember you were pretty famous for saying you know new story new team new tech uh new franchise really um can you just talk a little bit about putting all of that together and and actually maybe even get into a bit of the um what jim called the battle of the bulge because i remember the hiring frenzy yeah. going on was 
I, I'd never seen anything, and still to this day, have never seen anything like that before. It was crazy. I mean, I, yeah, the joke I used to make, and I think I did a talk at GDC about this, right, as the game was wrapping up. But um, we did everything was new, right? We we started out with a, ten, a team, uh, team of ten people, so we built a brand new team. For all intents and purposes, we were a new studio because you know, again, Jim had taken over and. There was a lot of change that had happened within LucasArts in a very short amount of time. Um, we built brand new tech for this, all from scratch. Um, it was, a, as you said, a new story, and it wasn't a sequel to anything, right? We had never done a game like this before. It wasn't like we were, you know, doing Battlefront 2 or something like that. Um, and then you add on top of that, in order to get the vision across, we did invest heavily in, in two new te technologies, which are showcased pretty well on this level right now as I'm watching you yeah, play. Yeah, right. Um, euphoria one is right there. This euphoria, which is what we call biomechanical AI. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it essentially oh. allows these human bodies to kind of react as you would expect um, when you lift them up or you throw them around. And it's much more reactive than ragdolls and looks, you know, more, um, gives a sense of randomness that you don't get with hand animated reactions. Um, so that, that was, you know, uh, a big technology we invested in. And then the other one was digital molecular matter, which allows materials to behave the way that you would expect based on real world physics. So metal to bin like metal and glass to shadow like glass. The problem is getting those two technologies and then a third, which is Havoc, which was our underlying physics system to talk together. So right now Sam's got a, uh, you know, a stormtrooper and he's picking him up and he was grabbing hold of a crate. That crate is a Havoc object. The stormtrooper is a euphoria, you know, uh, object. Those two things have to talk to each other. Then, if you were to pick up that guy, he grabs a crate and you throw him through a window. Now they also have to talk to digital molecular matter. So, we had things like the first time we had force push working on a euphoria guy, they exploded. They looked like Plastic Man had been electrocuted. <laughs> um, you know, we had bugs all the way up until you know close to ship where. You know, you would throw guys through windows and they, they would be moving so fast that the the simulations couldn't keep up and the windows wouldn't break, things like that. It was just, I mean, every day it was a new a new challenge with these three technologies trying to work together. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it was all worth it because you get something super unique out of it, you know. And um, I mean, even just the fun of picking up guys and throwing them around is endless because of Euphoria. So. The, uh, thank you. You know, David, actually, I once, just as a random thing, I remember David was playing this once, and you jumped up, and I've, I've tried to do this since. I've never been able to do it. You jumped up, and you force-pushed a TIE fighter, and it just landed in front of you. It was the most yeah. extraordinary thing. I'm like, how did you, what the, and you did it like it was no big deal. I was like, what? Said, yeah, there's, I mean, the, the Did I push it or grip it? You pushed it. You uh -huh. did a force-push to a TIE fighter that was headed right at you, and it just landed right in front of you. And then you just you just moved on like it was nothing. And I was like, what? <laughs> well, it's like the ultimate uh, force power sandbox. I mean, that seemed like, you know, I mean, you just sit here, especially this level, the TIE Fighter construction facility. You just, yeah. there's so much stuff to play with. And like, I remember too, you, Hayden, you saying that this isn't really like uh, a, more of a range game than it is a melee now, game. Now that was, I remember and that, was, that's something I used to say all the time because I heard I it from you, Hayden. And, right. And I used to say, when, when I was brought on and you said it's a ranged game, and I'm thinking it's a Jedi. I'm like, I just couldn't wrap my brain around it. I'm like, but Jedi have lightsabers. That doesn't make any sense. The lightsaber sense. stuff is fun, but it's not nearly as fun to me as grip, push, Well, it's lightning. not as deep a system. The lightsaber combat is not as deep a system as all of the force stuff that you can do in this game. Yeah. In fact, I remember talking to a kid at, at GameStop. And, and he was, you know, he's like, you're the Force Unleashed guy. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, man, I didn't like that game. And I'm like, I'm like let me guess. You lightsabered your way through the game? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, see that? <laughs> I'm like, that's not. The game was really more designed to to experiment. Yeah, can you talk balance. talk about the design in terms of what it was supposed to feel like to be a Jedi unleashed? Right. Yeah. So again, the from the very beginning, our kind of one of our mantras: what what's the core gameplay? And it's you know, I think you probably remember this. Kicking, kicking ass, ass, ass with the force. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that I mean, literally, that was our early pitch: is the game's all about kicking ass with the force. The, one of the challenges you do have working on Star Wars is that the core fantasy everybody wants is, you know, a Jedi, right? Like there, right. You, there are others that that you know people talk about, you know, being a, a trooper, being a bounty hunter, things like that. But when you go out and you actually talk to people about about playing Star Wars games, the 
core fantasy of being a Jedi far, far, far outweighs those other ones, right? There's, it's just, you know, it's, it's the fantasy of the Star Wars universe. But you have this issue where you've got this almost unstoppable, indestructible weapon, right, in the lightsaber. Um, so trying to balance those things is always challenging every game that we, you know, ever worked on. Um, so we kind of wanted to take some of it and say, look, let's, you know, let's put it into the vision of the Force and make the Force so over the top that the, you know, that the lightsaber is a useful tool, but it's, it's secondary to the Force powers. Um, and I think, you know, your so point's exactly right, Sam, that, that the people that played the game experimenting with the Force and using it, um, you know, creatively, I think had a much better time than people that just relied solely on the lightsaber. Although, you know, we tried to do things like the lightsaber force combos and right, right. Um, in order to kind of make that as, as fun as possible. And then with Force Unleashed 2, we did a lot more with the lightsaber like, too. And, with the limbing, know. yeah, cutting people's limbs off and stuff. So yeah. it was a balancing issue. That's so fascinating. Yeah. It's, it was an issue of balance. Yeah, because the lightsaber presumably is the most powerful yeah. weapon yeah. in the world. Well, and, and we debated like just not giving the player character a lightsaber until late in the game but it's just you know i don't know i don't know how you you know have a game with a a sith or a jedi who doesn't have a lightsaber it's it's like the magic wand right i mean you you know it'd be like harry potter without his wand you just can't you can't imagine well it's just interesting to again the lightsaber is one tool of many in this game and and that's that's you know again to use it in conjunction with everything else is the way to do it Um, right can you talk a little bit about we were just in that shield room where all those proto rebels come at you? Um, yeah. Can you talk a we're, little bit about the AI and what's that? David Cowan says, "Raise the shield gate." Raise the laser gate. Raise the laser gate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is increases um, your death by laser gate. By about 100%. Yeah, we raised it. <laughs> yeah, it was at ni- it was at ninety seven. Now it's at ninety nine. Yeah, it's been raised. It's very lethal. No, but I remember there was a conversation that I overheard about the AI all just kind of ganging up on you and like having to basically balance the AI to give you room to experiment with force powers as opposed to everyone coming at you at once. Can you talk about number of enemies yeah. on screen versus, you know, your force powers and difficulty tuning, etc.? Sure, yeah. So um, the enemies came on actually fairly late in the game and we, you know, there are kind of two ways to approach game design and, and a game like this in particular, right? You can either start with what are the abilities the player has, um, or you can start with, you know, kind of what are the enemy archetypes that you're fighting and how do you give the player um, abilities to counter those, right? And there's been great games made, you know, with either philosophy. We obviously started from the the player perspective of what are all the things that the player character can do first. Um, and that was that made it very challenging for the designers because here we're saying, well, you know, there's pretty much nothing the player can't do, right? He's got, again, this unstoppable melee weapon in the lightsaber. He's got force push. He's got force grip. He can pick guys up and throw them around. So a lot of it came down to the speed of combat and this idea that attrition would be what got you over time. It wouldn't be, in rare cases, it wasn't going to be any one single enemy. Um, so we did design a lot of enemy units that could kind of storm you, could surround you, um, could combine melee and, and range combat so that you were... You know, while you were dealing with guys in the in the front row, you were you know other guys were taking pot shots at you um, from a distance, so you would have to think about who you take out. Um, and then a lot of it was just in our spawning rules, you know, creating waves of enemies, and then having moments where you would do things like this, fight a, a big ATST. Um, I will say, you know, one of the learn one of the big learnings I think from this for me as a game developer is we did design probably too many enemies, so. I, I can't remember how many, you know, there's over a hundred different enemy types in the game. Um, so you end up with a lot that are very similar, um, that aren't that memorable. And for Force Unleashed 2, you know, we did far fewer enemy types. And I think as a result, mechanically, from a gameplay perspective, Force Unleashed 2 is probably a better game. It's. I, right, I it's wanted the... to talk about Force Unleashed 2 um, a little bit because I, I, I do think it is important to reiterate what you just said, which is that you know, it is actually from a mechanical standpoint and a gameplay standpoint, a superior game in a lot of ways. Um, because you guys put so much work into tuning and refining um, yeah. the systems. Uh, and then there just wasn't a lot of, t- a lot of time to actually build the game, <laughs> you know? Well, um, yeah, yeah. And, and I, everyone knows this. I mean, we've talked about this before, you know, but, but it, I mean, it really was like super inspiring to see the evolution of, of, uh, of force unleashed. Um, and really interesting to hear about, uh, you know, hear about the problems that you faced in the first one. Uh, I remember yeah, you also. I mean, sorry, go ahead. 
Well, I just even, you know, you're building your own tech, right? And getting all these things to work together. I think we built most of the game for Force Unleashed 1 in like eight or nine months, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I mean, the fact that it turned out as well as it did is probably is, is kind of a minor miracle uh, because of that. Um, and then again, with Force Unleashed 2, we were able to take a lot of our learnings and apply it to that. We had an incredibly short amount of time to develop that game too. But um, again, I think while it's very short from a content standpoint mechanically it's so much stronger because we learned so much making the first game the uh it's interesting when games are because i'm i'm working on a, a game right now um funny enough another one where, where it uses my likeness and mocap and all that stuff yeah. days gone days gone um yeah. but what's what's funny is that uh you, you ever you come up with like a vision for a game right and you have all these things that are going to happen and then you have to cut a bunch of stuff, uh, always, because you're just like, okay, we bit off a little bit more than we can chew. There's no way we can get this all done. And then you cut it. And uh, one of the things about this Force Unleashed is that uh, the the game itself, the the story, was so sort of big and epic that even with the cuts, um, it still felt like kind yeah. of an incredible journey. Can you talk about some of the things that were cut from your uh, from your story document? Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, and you guys might even remember some that I forget, but the... We shot some stuff. Yeah, yeah. um, So, you know, the original storyline was a little bit longer, right? And I think, actually, you know, as we got into production, we realized how much we could actually build. We ended up cutting a few planets and and locations, and I think the biggest change was that in the original design, um, Maris Brood was a Jedi that you hunted down early in the game. Right. She wasn't Shakti's apprentice. She was a, a jet, a, like a Jedi pirate on Cloud City um, that you would hunt down. And, and so when we cut all that, we we didn't want to lose Maris Brood. We wanted to keep her as a character. And so we you know, rejiggered the story so that she was Shakti's apprentice and then you would fight her later when you go back to Felucia um, later in the game. So that, that was kind of the biggest change that I remember. Um, there were some things that ended up on the chopping block that we salvaged, like the proxy battle late in the game uh, where he becomes Darth Maul, and uh, that was on the chopping block forever. Um, and finally, a couple guys ended up, you know, I don't know, working over a couple weekends to pull it off and prove that we didn't have to cut it, which was awesome because that was, you know, one of my favorite, it's still one of my favorite parts of the game. Yeah. Uh, what else do you guys remember though? About like, what do you remember that we filmed? See, that, now I I remember that Proxy um, throughout the story was constantly trying to kill you. In in the game, yes. he, he he tries to kill you at the beginning of the game, then he tries to kill yeah. you later on. Uh, right. Raxus on the, Prime on the Empirical as well. But in the on the Empirical, right? Exactly. Um, um, although that that's more of a he gives you a fighting chance. Yeah, he's like I've set course to a nearby star. What? Why did yeah, you do yeah. that? What? You know? Well, you know. Um, but the in the original script that I read, he was all the time plotting all kinds of ambushes yeah. and stuff like that. And one of the things that I thought was one of the most interesting ambushes that Proxy planted for the apprentice was that he kept showing up as different Jedi, different uh, yes. first characters, and at yeah. one point. And you got the idea that the apprentice had probably faced a lot of these these uh, avatars before, but at one point the apprentice goes, "Whoa, proxy, who's this? A new one, huh? Interesting." Yeah. And it was Anakin. And, oh right. Yeah. And uh, I remember at that point me and David having like a, a a nerd moment where we're like, "Oh my God, that you know what that implies? That implies that Vader personally built proxy. Yeah. Right, he would have right. tested out all these systems." And the thought of Vader testing out Proxy as Anakin Skywalker gave us many geek chills. Yeah, <laughs> we were yeah. like, "Oh, that's so cool!" Yeah. So, and so you I know re- what's funny is that in the in the quote unquote shooting script that I have, those scenes are all still in there. So right. well, we um, shot them. I think we did shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we did shoot. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I remember asking you too. Like Vader built Proxy, right? And even on the team, I don't think you would give us an answer because you were no, you, right. you wanted you to hold that back. I'm not. I'm not telling yeah. you that. Do you remember my, my favorite kind of proxy story? Do you remember the earliest concept for proxy? Yeah, he was like a reverse Corpse cyborg. Droid. Like Corpse droid. Droid. Yeah. 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 So the idea that he was a reverse cyborg, he was trying to replace all of his um, inorganic parts with organic parts. So uh, 
Yeah, so, that sometimes you, sometimes you make really good decisions on what to cut, and I think that was <laughs> the Yeah, one of the things that um, would be interesting to do sometime too is to play through the PS2 or Wii version because a lot of the stuff oh, that yeah. was written, what was cut in our game, the did survive. Battle of Counts. Yeah. Yeah, so there's all yeah. of Juno's backstory, which I think yeah. kind of really helped her character a lot that you wrote and we shot. And we shot. Um, and we had to shoot everything two or three times because yeah. we did it, you know, mocap, and then we did it again as voiceover for the PS2. Yeah. Um, uh, that was a really great backstory. You kind of kind of understood, you know, Juno a lot Most better. And um, uh, Do you want to talk about the decision to cut that? To of what the... The whole cut... There was a whole cinematic about leading the Battle of Callus and... Her explaining, the, she was basically responsible for the destruction of the entire yeah. world. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice you know, thing. I think again, some of it came down to um, that is again still in the shooting script, right? And I think I think we put some of that VO though in one of the levels, um, but it came again. That came down to a production reality of just how many cinematics can we build by the time right. you know we're we're due to ship, right? Um, right. and we need to obviously focus on the story of the apprentice. Um, but I agree, like I, you know, and, and maybe it's because I had such a strong memory of it, writing it and, and it being in my head. When I read the shooting script a couple of weeks ago, like I didn't even realize that we had cut that from the final game. I thought it was still in the final game. So, you know, well, yeah, uh, and it was in, yeah, you know, on the PS, on the PSP, the Wii, the PS2, yeah. it was. Yeah. And uh, just not on on the uh, the PS3 and the like, sort of the flagship versions that we we're building right, for right. the new tech. Yeah. Right. And we just bar I remember, and I think I said this on a previous stream that this is, uh, and I think this is a, a sentiment shared by a lot of members of the team. It's the hardest thing I've ever done, and and as a result, um, it's something I'm most proud of of anything I've yeah. ever done because it was all of those things. One of the things we forgot to mention is there was new consoles too. I mean. Oh yeah, God. God. the yeah. Xbox 360 we had, but the <clears throat> PS3 didn't come on until we were like six months to to being finished, and and we couldn't get the thing to run. I didn't even have a way of playing sound on the thing, and yeah. you know, and I, I remember you know having a lot of emergency meetings with you, Hayden, and 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 Julio Torres, and a lot of people in engineering about how we were going to get sound to to run on a new console, and it was running it, you know like five frames a second when we first turned it on. I mean, just all kinds of ridiculous stories that I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but... You know, um, he's getting wrong. He's giving... I'm getting it all wrong. That's right. No, no, no. So that's right. I mean... The, oh, we're uh, getting that right. Okay. I, I <laughs> forgot about that. Is that we, you know, because, again, we've been living with these consoles for so long, but these were, you know... It was the first time we had ever done anything on these consoles. And um, as a, you know, as a company even, right? And very few games, when we kicked this off, it started... It, even development on it. I think we were a year in before we got our first, you know, Sony dev kit. And um, it was, yeah, it was insane. Um, and then we had, you know, the Wii came out and the PSP and we wanted to support as many platforms as possible. So that was also kind of a logistical challenge. Um, well, there were three to make sure that studios. we were consistent with the story and the look of the games across all these platforms. Um, and then you had on top of that, you've got, Again, two technologies that had never shipped in another game before. Certainly never shipped together and, and not shipped on these platforms. So it was, I, I mean, I still am amazed that the game was ever greenlit. Because if you were looking at an outside developer to sign up and publish a game from them, having all those risks together, I think, would be, you know, it's not, you'd pass on it, you know. But uh, LucasArts and Jim in particular had a vision for where he wanted to take take the company and and you know signed up for this big ambitious project yeah it was now, all trips in wasn't are we at liberty to talk about indiana jones or no probably uh not. probably not probably well i mean the game came out but the 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 360 version never came out yeah. right because there was another game that was using some of these same systems uh in development at the time as well Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, everyone saw that demo. I actually, I demoed that game at yeah. E3. Indiana in like Jones and the staff yeah. of Kings. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And I believe that we pilfered their staff. <laughs> I mean, not the staff of Kings, but the, the actual... Well, I, it's fair to say, what we can say is it's fair to say that all of the resources of LucasArts and Lucasfilm at the time had to basically rally together to get this thing out to make. I mean, it was... Happen. It was a huge, it was a huge undertaking. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was in, like, incredible. Um... Uh, I yeah, but then you compare it to modern standards, it was, you know, 
we had maybe a fifth of the size of a modern team. <laughs> well, I know by modern right. standards, it's hard to understand because, you know, tools are so mature now. A lot of stuff yeah, is yeah. off the shelf or the companies that have kind of survived at this point have a mature tool set and they've learned that iteration, you know, all the stuff we've talked about and, and stuff that, you know, we shouldn't be telling you because you just put out just Mafia like 3. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's right. a different Hayden, world. We want to tell you now. about this. Yeah, we would yeah, love well, to explain Hayden, here's to you how game development how works. Game Hayden. Development works. <laughs> Let me just tell you about your award winning game that. Uh, By the way, I want to bring something up. Someone said in chat. Yes, chat. We are eventually, sometimes, we're, we are going to get to you and get some questions. Oh, yes. But someone uh, said in chat, uh, they commented on the fact that I just blinded a, a Jedi. And. Yeah. I would love to talk a little bit, of, uh, at least, at least acknowledge the fact that here we are on Raxus Prime, a garbage world, right, where a dark Jedi character is looking for a mad Jedi-like character. Hint, hint. A mad Jedi-like character who um, who has spider legs, right? So that's that's kind of a familiar thing here in Force Unleashed that we got this garbage world, person su uh, seeking out a mad spider-like Jedi. Also, uh, the blinding of um, General Coda. Uh, there was another character in Star Wars that blinded another Jedi, and I played that character too. <laughs> so, and and, and the, the whole spider-Jedi, Chasm Paradis, uh, Darth Maul in the cave type thing. Again, it's, it's funny to me how these ideas kind of echo throughout the um, throughout the saga, and it's even funnier when I uh, when I think that I you get I to play a, them all. Yeah, I got a chance <laughs> of being both. Um, I, I think we came first, though, right? We, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Well, and you can say if it wasn't for Force Unleashed, you I know, wouldn't be in, I wouldn't have been in Clone Wars or Rebels if it wasn't for Force Unleashed. Well, I was going to say, I mean, I'm sure that it affect greatly affected those those stories. I mean, you know. We're not Dave Filoni. We've never had him on here, but like right. you know, Dave um, did share with me. By the way, he 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 uh, considered um, making Star Killer uh, an Inquisitor in Star Wars Rebels, and it just oh, oh, snap. It didn't quite fit the story that they were telling, but um, yeah. but he he did think about it because he thought that would be an interesting. He's idea. been very good about taking you know Lucas Arts yeah. and and novel ideas, and I mean Thrawn is a great yeah. example of that. Uh, by the way, Hayden, why is there an X wing here? Uh, you know, a few years before A New Hope, uh, on the um, garbage planet of Rises Prime. Why is there an X? Why is it not a Zenic Five? Why? Wait, look at it. Is it an X wing or a headhunter? Well, it's an X wing with different cannons on it. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. So maybe it's a different style. It looks old. I'll give you that. You made it. You made it's it. An early, it's an early prototype. It's there you go. Oh. The mic was in picture. The mic was in picture. Um, I, I say this because I gave Hayden a lot of grief about that uh, back in the day. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely casting a Star Wars fan as our uh, the main character mistake. was a double edged sword. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Yeah, it's said. He finally said it. He finally said it. He's admitting it was a big mistake. Huge uh, no, no, mistake. No, <laughs> We're all still reeling from it, actually, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the reason you got the gig, though, man. I got to tell you, I think you and I have talked about this, but the, the you know, we, we auditioned a ton of people for the role. Um, David kept saying, hey, you know, we should check out this, uh, my buddy Sam, he's, you know, going to be, I think we knew by that point you were going to be dark side. Uh, maybe not. Maybe it was, uh, no, came oh, a little bit later. Yeah, no, that but, was later. Um, no, he yeah. had just done Battlestar. That's and, what it was, Battlestar Galactica. And can, right? I, can I give you a little setup for this audition process so you can tell the story, Hayden? Yeah. Um, yeah, one yeah. of the challenges we had as an industry is that theatrical agents didn't – we didn't have any contacts with theatrical agents. So for people that are watching and, and listening, you know, there are voiceover agents, which is typically who the games industry dealt with, and then there are theatrical agents who do on-camera TV, film, things like that. We didn't have any of those relationships, and I don't think theatrical agents were even that interested. No. So didn't... all of the on-camera people that we're getting for auditions were through voiceover agencies. That's right. Which was very for strange at the time. Camera. For on-camera. Yeah. And some agencies actually had an on-camera department and a voiceover department, so we had that. But we were literally um, trying to think of every trick in the book in order to get great actors to come out for this. Um, going to London was a huge was a huge step forward, not just for this, but also for the Indiana Jones game. But like in the States, I mean, trying to get people. Oh, wait, really quick. Uh, yeah. Indiana Jones tidbit. I remember Dara, he went. I, I also have heard this story after the fact because I wasn't with the company at the time, nor have I ever been with the company. But I love <laughs> I love talking about yeah, when I was with the company with, with LucasArts. 
Um, Dara went to uh, London to cast for the Indiana Jones game. And Dara knows a lot about Star Wars, but maybe a little bit less about Indiana Jones. And he's like, hey, I found this actor who would be really great for the villain in the Indiana Jones game. His name's uh, uh, Julian Glover. Julian Glover. <laughs> or was it Julian Glover? And he's like, he's like, I think he was uh, General Veers in Star Wars, too. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, he was also the villain in the third Indiana <laughs> the Jones crusade, movie. The Last Crusade, yeah. So I'm glad you auditioned him. Uh, we're probably not going to use him. He's a great guy. <laughs> oh, uh, that's so bro- awesome. <laughs> Anyway, back to the casting of Force Unleashed. Sorry, yeah, but yeah. anyway, so like, yeah, we were looking for every 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 uh, great person we could get, and I remember when Amy drew that concept art, I was like, God, Amy that Beth looks Christensen. Like Sam. Amy Beth Christensen. Yeah. I was like, God, that looks like Sam, and and uh, turned out Peter was a huge fan of uh, of uh, Battlestar, and so Dara was like, slip his his reel and resume into the pile, and so, oh, so yeah. So Dara gave you permission to do that. You didn't just you didn't go rogue. I I didn't go rogue because okay. I tried to get you in both Battlefront and Republic Commando. And Republic Commando, and, and I failed. auditioned for Scorch. Yes, you did. Yes, and I think you did a Han Solo at one point too. But anyway, so <laughs> sorry, the you, you had an audition so story hidden of Are Sam. <clears throat> yeah. So then, I mean, the thing I remember is obviously we were going through headshots and stuff, and then we got your audition tape and and. This was again the first time, at least certainly on any project I worked on, where you were in the room. We actually, by the way, Hayden, with the audition. I remember getting direction from you. Uh, maybe the second callback, because the first stuff I saw was you had done a reading, um, and a, a taped reading. Yeah, and there was a sequence where you were assembling the lightsaber, right? And you're um, meditating. Yeah, meditating, and it, it looked like such a struggle. And I remember asking, you know, later I asked you, why why had you done it that way? You know, why had you kind of made it look like, you know, he was almost in pain assembling this? And your response back was, well, he's a, he's a dark Jedi, right? He's a Sith. So something that is kind of calming and meditative for another Jedi would be very difficult and challenging for him, right? And it was like just the level of thought you put into the audition uh, kind of sealed the deal for me, so... Um, because you, you know, clearly were a Star Wars fan, right? And knew what, what the difference between a Jedi and Sith might, might look like, you know? It was, uh, now here, I, the way I recall it, Hayden, is you actually asked me while I was in the audition. The, the story right. that I, that I always tell about this is that the Force Unleashed was unusual audition wise because with auditions, basically you, you act for like, I don't know, five minutes, maybe tops, right? Like, you know, you're, you don't. You don't do a lot of acting. You do some acting, and and maybe you talk. <laughs> maybe you go, "Hi, how are you?" Or you know, you you know, because people are trying to figure out whether they want to work with you or not. So they have a they have to have a sense of your personality, what it's going to be like to spend tons of time with you. But uh, Force Unleashed was different because instead of it it being like a long audition process with five to ten minutes of acting, it was forty five minutes of performance. Because right. I I um said to you and I said to the other people in the room, Dara O'Farrell, I said, well, tell me a little Maddo bit about... Was, Maddo was there. Maddo was there as well. And I uh, and I saw the concept art, which heartened me because I made it did actually look quite a bit like yeah. me at that time. And um, <clears throat> I remember asking, I'm like, well, who is the character? What is the character? What can you tell me about him? And, and I remember you or Maddo or both of you guys going, well, what do you, what do you want to bring to it? You know, you what you tell us. What do you what do you show us? What you think the character could be? And I said, well, I could think about like fifty different versions of this character. And you said very almost defiantly when you're Hayden Blackman way. You said, well, all right, we'll show me them all. And I was like, oh god! Oh, but I was I didn't I mean fifty. That. I I meant maybe like I don't know. And and so we did it over and over. Oh again. my god! You got called out. I don't. With, yeah, was I got that called at? out because I was being all cocky. I'm like, yeah, man. Was that out Lucas Arts? You're like, yeah, all right, show it to me. Like, you have oh, met no. your match, Sam. Oh no! Yeah. So <laughs> so I remember over and over again doing the scenes in as many different ways as I could possibly think, yeah. and. Uh, <laughs> and so it was it was exhausting and the thing is when you do it that many times which I've, again I don't think I've ever done an audition where I did the scenes that many times and when you do it that many times you think either either I think I have this role or I, I have yet to get it right we've been doing this now for <laughs> yeah, like right. 35 minutes and we no, have not gotten it, one good one you know you know what's part of it and, and again as I've done more titles I've probably gotten a little more focused with this but is it I, for me I was really concerned that 
whoever we brought in had a range, right? Because we got this character, he couldn't go through the, the game and be all one note, you know, grim, dark, you know, apprentice, right? Like he had to be able to, he had to be believable as somebody that could, could have a friendship with Proxy. He had to be believable as somebody that could have a relationship with Juno. He had to be believable as somebody that the rebels would care about. Like, you know, and the, and I think that there's a huge, you know, there is an arc for this character and every scene's a little, you know, I mean, just again, rereading the script, just the power of the moment when Vader betrays him, mm-hmm. you know, the second time, right? Like, um, Not again. Yeah, right. <laughs> come on, and, and, come on. <laughs> Making sure that that was going to be believable, I think, was yeah. important. So, and I, I still do this to this day. Like when we, you know, are casting for other projects, I, you know, we write four or five scenes that'll be all over the map emotionally, just to make sure that the actors have range, so that we know that, you know, if we bring them in to to play a role, they're going to be able to hit all the highs and lows. Here's that scene we were talking about, right? Yeah, the assembling of the lightsaber, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, which oh, again, just even here, and. You know, we can do so much more with facial capture today, but for the time, this was like groundbreaking. So even just the moment where he furrows his brow there, that little subtle hint of like struggle was awesome. You know, there's a smirk that he gives, uh, and I'll point it out where it was like it was one for one motion cap, like what we did on the set to to this uh, was translated perfectly. I remember you calling it. You're like, here, this smirk right here. Mm-hmm. Boom. That's you. Like, that's yeah. very yeah. Uh, what we did on the set. But yeah, I mean, it was. It was exciting, the idea that, I don't know, I I, I, ne- I didn't get a sense, I had no idea that, that this project was going to be something that people really identified me with. I had no idea it was going to help so much in my career. Um, because I've, I, I, Hayden, I don't know if I've, I've probably told you, like I've had meetings and stuff where very well thought of showrunners and stuff go, hey, so Force Unleashed, man, tell me about that. Or, you know, they, uh, people bring this stuff up even to this day. Um, but, uh, and I, and I, again, what I attribute to that is just the fact that you guys made the decision about the likeness thing. If it wasn't my likeness, I don't know that I would. I mean, you were on the cover. Right, and I don't know yeah. if you yeah. get as much credit if it's not your likeness. Um, you know, uh, with great, great respect to Nolan North and uh, Troy Baker, um, and and they they now get a lot of recognition. But it took time for them to get that. Yeah, recognition. I mean, it's a different industry now. Yeah, yeah I mean, they, sure. they do get it now. But yeah, I mean, this was, and you were kind of the first person to do that. This, Correct me if I'm is wrong. Is this Hayden? Is this the first time that that video games use the likeness of the actors? No, I mean, you know, there are obviously the in the days of, of actual video and video games, you know, games like Wing Commander or oh, whatever. Oh, sure, sure, right, sure. Wing Commander. That, you know, there were things like that. Um, and I'm shocking. sure that I'm sure we weren't the first one to do it, even with a, you know, um, a, a, a all CG character. But certainly I think we were one of the biggest titles and, and the one that, you know, we made it we made it part of the story. You know, we made it mm-hmm. part of the, the PR campaign and everything. You know, it wasn't. Um, we didn't shy away from it, right? We wanted people to know that we were embracing this and that we were pushing new technology and that we were, you know, uh, thought that this was going to make storytelling better in games. And, and we were working with ILM on, you know, the mocap and stuff like that. So, well, I guess it's, it, so then would this be, I mean, I guess Wing Commander and stuff, certainly, pe- you know, we've had full motion video, but is this, yeah. is this the first time that that it was a digital character where you very well could have done whatever you wanted with the likeness and and you chose to stick with the actor's likeness is that is this the first time because this is not all the time these days we were if we weren't the first we were one of the first right i mean i'm sure that they were you know again i think that the games based on uh, you know other licenses um stupid licenses that people don't were we're doing it i'm sure you know if you were doing a movie based game (laughs) you know you were probably looking at at uh, you know, using the likeness of, of the actors that were in there, at least from the standpoint of modeling the character to look like those actors to the degree that you could from a, you know, whatever contractual perspective. Um, but certainly I think we were, again, one of the very first to, to go all in with it, right? And try and, right. you know, not just capture what you look like, but get nuances of your performance too, uh-huh. you know? Do you have a favorite part about making this game? Is it a favorite aspect or a favorite memory? Or if that's too hard to choose. I mean, because I know we've talked a lot about the challenges, but, you know, I, I mean, I look back on this and I, I mean, the team culture was so strong. You know, uh, the people were so were so great. Did, what are some of your favorite memories working on this? Yeah, you know, God, there are so many. Um, I think, and just watching this brings back uh, a lot. I think 
you know, um, the first time I saw a concept art of Coda, uh, and it was, we had been in a meeting and we were talking about that character. And I think I described them as kind of a exiled samurai, a Ronin. And Amy Beth went away and came back with this, you know, it, like within hours came back with the first sketch of him. And I was like, that's, that's exactly what I had in my mind's eye. Jeez. Um, She's so good there were that, particularly. You, you became was, drunk with yeah. power at that point. That's, at that point, you knew that yeah. this team would do anything that you asked, <laughs> yeah. and that you could. It, it, yeah, it was crazy. I mean, it was well. So it was that, and then it was like Juno was another one where she just nailed it right away. Like the very first image of Juno, we're like, "Yep, yeah, that's her." You know, let's try and cast for that. Um, hey, by I the think, way, Juno Eclipse was the original name for a different Star Wars character that you designed. Yeah. Yeah. That's a nice little piece of uh, trivia there. You want to tell that story? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So You designed um, a different Star Wars so, character, and, and that was the, her name at the time. Yeah, so survived. I, I was writing for Dark Horse on the side, and one of the kind of assignments I got, which was awesome, was that they wanted to create two new villains based on concept art that had been done um, up at Lucasfilm. Um, one of them became Dirge the Bounty Hunter, and the other was Asajj Ventress. So I wrote up their backstories. I think I did the first um, first stories with them in them. I don't know if mine were the first published, but I wrote the first stories, and then those became the basis for what Dirge and, and Ventress would be later. But but yeah, Juno Eclipse was was her name originally. <laughs> was Ventress's name. So um, and uh, the feeling was, I think, you know, from whoever makes these decisions, that it didn't sound um, uh, it didn't sound dangerous enough, or it didn't sound, you know. And again, I just wanted something evocative and easy to remember, right? So I always liked the name, so we kept it around um, from for uh, obviously re resurrected it here, and I think it's perfect for you know for Juno in this game. Um, yeah, so I'll tell you another really great moment. I, I, I'll never forget the first read-throughs. You know, we had never done that before either. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I did something cruel to you on that day. Anyway, go on. If, if, uh, I, I wonder yeah, if you're going to remember what I remember about the read-through. No, I just remember getting us all around the table, and we had never done anything like that before. And what was cool about it for me was that I was able to rewrite, you know, lines and, and parts of the script on the fly as I saw the kind of interchange between the characters and actually – hearing it out loud with professional actors um, was fantastic, right? So um, so now, again, that's another kind of um, uh, process thing that I do on every project I work on is making sure that we do read-throughs and that we get everybody together. And it's just, it's, you just build that camaraderie, right? Like, you know, getting to know each other around a table and making mistakes as we go through it and, you know, realizing that we're all human. It was awesome, you know, it was just... It was fantastic. So as I recall, we did two read-throughs, and and in one read-through, I did something that I consider, I, I consider at this point to be a little cruel, although I didn't think of it that, that at the time. And then on the second read-through, you got me back by doing something uh, equally cruel. Um, so, <laughs> so what happened was, I at the time being a younger actor than I am now, um, I had this point of view. And to a certain extent, I still have this, but but uh, I don't have it as strongly. I had this point of view of like, okay, we're gonna do a read through, but I'm not gonna, I'm not really gonna act at all, and and so I was kind of monotone throughout the whole first read through. And I right. remember, do, I don't, do you remember that? I, I remember oh, saying, yeah, yeah, you know, so you hire this actor, right? Well, you had seen people do that on Battlestar, right? Sure, yeah. You had well, seen other actors. Ever James table. almost. Who, I mean, like, we gotta get the greatest console. Right, 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 right. Yeah. No, come so on. So that's how it's done, done right? Guys, you know? time. Well, yeah, but part of that is that the, there's a reason for it, and the reason is you're saving your performance for the day. And I know that sounds funny. And, you know, oh, they're saving it. Oh, these foofy actors with their stupid beliefs about stuff. And some of that is stupid, but some of it is actually very real. That if you if you put too much into something, you're gonna remember it on some level. And that you're, you'll that, lose the freshness and spontaneity. That performance and... is going to be burned into your memory, and then next thing you know, when you're actually performing it, instead of actually living in the moment and performing it and doing something new, you're reproducing something that you've already done. Feels canned. It right. feels canned yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So I was trying to protect the performances by, but at the same time, having said that, these days, if, if you got like me now as an actor, I would have given you a little something. As opposed yeah. to literally reading through the whole thing completely monotone and probably scaring the hell out of everyone around that table thinking, what have we done? What? <laughs> <laughs> what? Why? And I should have known that. You know what I mean? I, I, I was young, but I wasn't 
that young, you know. Um, so I was, anyway. So where you got me back, um, the situation where, okay, so I'm saying to David Collins on the side, I'm like, hey, man, so listen, um, I asked around, and you guys aren't getting, like, Ian McDermott to play the Emperor. I mean, you're getting, you know, you're getting um, Bail Organa. Jimmy Smith, you're getting uh, Jimmy Smith to play Bail Organa, but you're not getting Ian McDermott. And David's like, sure. Is that, is that better? Sorry, I'm adjusting yeah. your mic, oh, so you're you. a little the louder. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, uh, so I'm like, yeah, so, so, you know, you're not getting Ian McDermott. And David's like, okay, we're not. So what? You know, and I'm like, well, I should do it. <laughs> and then I remember you being like, you were very polite about it, but you were like, okay. I remember being like, my all friend right. wants all the things. Yeah. He's already <laughs> so got I remember like, Star Wars game. what have I done? Oh, my God. Now he's like reaching <laughs> Now he wants the Emperor. He's potentially he's lost his mind. creating a very uncomfortable political situation with the lead actor who's, who now wants <laughs> totally. things. Totally. Uh, and and so, so I'm like talking about it all the time. And you are trying to temper my expectations. You're like, hey, listen, by the I way. I wasn't discouraging, though. You weren't. No, I was you just weren't. like, hey. Hey, hey Sam, the... really quick. Pull one of those teeth out. Pull, what was Sorry. that? Pull one of the Go teeth out. Go back to those, that area. Pull one of those teeth oh, out. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, that one is not a, that one doesn't have the gummy. Here we go. Oh, yeah. yes. Anyway, thank Gross. you for telling your story. But I, I just that. wanted to point out that, that that was another interaction between, I think, Debt Havoc and uh, DMM, you know. Yeah, the, the gums were DMM and oh, the yeah, tooth that was having. Right. That, that gum, this place is full of yeah, yeah. disease like tartar, and we are now, yeah. It's, it, uh, Force Unleashed is about dentistry. It's about deep yeah, cleaning yeah. the sarlacc's deep mouth. Cleaning the sar well, and that was the other thing is these spikes are coming out. You don't know what the spikes are about until later you yeah. realize you're on top of a giant yeah, sarlacc. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, sorry, finish your story. <laughs> so so I'm already talking to David about it. David, then then David, you're like, okay, if if my friend is going to do it, or at least attempt to do it, he said, well, "He's like, look, just just maybe be quiet about it for a little bit." And and furthermore, on this read through, this second read through, because I think you tapped me on the shoulder and said, "said Hey, you might want to show them a little bit of something in the next read through." I, I think you did. I think you were like, "I probably hey. did." You said, "But but when it comes to showing them something at the read through, just show them Star Killer. Don't, don't do the Emperor. Don't do the Emperor." He's like, "He's like, if we're if we're gonna have a real chance at you doing the Emperor, let me record it. Let me pitch it down. Let me." process it and then we'll show it to Hayden so he's like don't do the Emperor and um, and so I did not prepare the Emperor at this point I actually looked through the script prepared a little bit because I was going to show Hayden a, a glimpse of what Starkiller was going to be like so that he didn't fire me um, <laughs> but but I did not prepare the Emperor at all and so during the what's up boys and so during the read through I remember I'm sitting there and the Emperor is coming up and uh and I'm preparing not to do it. And then Hayden, you look at me with with the Hayden Blackman smile on your face. And you said, oh, hey, so you want to do the Emperor I'm hearing. You want, you're always talking about wanting to do the Emperor. I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, go ahead, do it. <laughs> oh, but I didn't prepare. I don't know what he's, ah, oh, damn it. So I did like this really not very good version, but I, I tried my best. Got you the gig eventually. Well, yeah, I remember I did it and, and you looked surprised that I could even get through, like Hayden looked surprised like I, I, that I could even get through it. And frankly, I was surprised too that I could even get through it. Um, but uh, that somehow caused you to <clears throat> acquiesce and give the actor what he wanted, which was right. a terrible mistake. What I remember about those table reads is, <laughs> I, I, and the auditions too, is that I kept reading Leia. So I had to read the Leia well. and Juno. I had to read Juno across from you, which was awkward. Yeah, it's always um, Wait, oh, that's right. Now, now but we I, hadn't I, arrived yet. Is that no, 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 sorry. In the audition process. Sorry, oh, you're right. At the table read, Natalie was there. Uh, at the time, we didn't have Leia. We didn't have Proxy. We didn't have um, We didn't have uh, Jimmy Smith yet nope. as Bail Organa. We didn't have Vader. But we knew we were getting Jimmy. I don't. I Did think we? that was still up in the air. That was still because oh, that weird. that didn't yeah. actually come together until like the week before we recorded. Mm -hmm. um, that was another incredible day. It was with Jimmy Smith. Yeah, he was great. He was great. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah the table read. I mean, my attitude now with those table reads is that it's you know I played football in high school and we would do practices at half speed, right? So that's kind of the, right, right, you know, right. Uh, some practices at half speed, so you did so you had something ready for the game, right? So now I I look at it that way that you know table reach should be kind of half speed so that you get a little bit of an idea and you can 
But really, it's an opportunity for the, in my mind, for the actors to ask questions, right? Like, sure. You know, what is the intent of the scene? What, what is this? What's the relationship between these characters right now? Am I angry? Like, and just try and get uh, from a very high level the, you know, kind of the, the, the vision of the, in this case, the, you know, the writer and the project leader, right? But, right. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that was a really great memory for me. Um, and then I think, I get just every little day that, or every day when we had a little victory, like, you know, the first time we saw a fight with a rancor or the first time we saw the ability to, you know, grab a, a TIE fighter and, you know, beat the heck out of a bunch of stormtroopers with it. Like there were just, it felt like there was a period of time in development where every day I was coming in and seeing something new and that was incredibly exciting. Really fun. Yeah. yeah. God, I love, by the way, Felucia, this is another really interesting thing about this game is that uh, so we've seen Felucia in episode uh, three. For like two seconds. For two seconds. Yeah. Um, and the color palette was very, very different. Very bright right. color palette. You know, it was, it was sort of the uh, Skittles planet. Um, and it was amazing. This was a very dirty Felucia. Like you can feel the dirt and the grit on this version of this planet. And I think that's so... I, I get fits Force Unleashed. Force Unleashed being, you know, well, and this is Felucia Part One, right? It's even worse. Yeah, it's even on Part worse Two. On part Two, where yeah. the Empire is getting involved, and that was another. We, okay, and that David and and Hayden, something really interesting to bring up is the efficient use of assets, right? Yeah. You you have a situation where you have a game. Where, <laughs> I mean, this was at a time, this must have been sort of new, because before this, with the PS2 development cycles, if you wanted to create a game that had 10 levels, you could create 10 planets, you could create the art assets for those 10 planets and whatever, and you move on, and the art assets aren't that detailed anyway, so whatever, you get it done. Now we're talking about a situation where the art assets are approaching, like, the type of work you'd need to do on a feature, and uh, you need these giant teams... And not to mention, also, it's not just that you need these giant teams to create way more detailed art assets, but also you might not have space on the disc to create right. those ten planets. You might you might have only space on the disc to create four planets or five planets. So what I thought was so interesting about Force Unleashed is that knowing that these planets were going to be reused, that you go are, back to Kashyyyk, you, you go, go back, back to, to Raxus, you go back to Raxus, you go back to Felucia, and you go back to Felucia. So that's three three reuses of planets you've already been to. Yeah. But what what made it work, and what I thought was so smart about the story, and I would love to know if this was a conscious effort on your part, uh, um, Hayden, is if this is a story about a dark side character who is turning to the light, the reverse Luke Skywalker journey, like a kid from the wrong side of the tracks who is turning to the good side. Mm -hmm. Um the galaxy itself is turning to the dark side. Right. So you're seeing these, you know, the planet as it was. You see Kashyyyk as it was. And then you see it after it has been converted to the dark side by Vader and the stormtroopers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Same thing with these different places. You Like, the character has to go through and undo what he's done in the first half of the game. In the first half of the game, he served the dark side. In the, in the second half of the game, the consequences of those actions are, are present in the art design of the planets so i want to know how conscious that was when writing the script that this was a, a story about redemption but the planets themselves uh showed that there was a requirement there was a need for redemption i thought that was yeah cool. it was 100 percent conscious right so i mean obviously you're always when you're developing a game like you said you're always looking at ways that you can you know kind of manage the production and and how do you reuse assets in a smart way but from very early on, I knew that I wanted a sequence in the game where, um, at least once, where the apprentice was forced to confront what he had done, right. um, and how that affected not just him, but in the case of Felucia, an entire planet. Right. So, you know, when you go back to um, Felucia in particular, Maris Brutes kind of con corrupted all the Felucians and and the planet itself with the dark side, right? Because you killed her master, she was left to fall to the dark side alone. And I think, you know, that was a, a pretty powerful moment where, and then ultimately ends up sparing her, right? Because he realizes that what happened to her is as much his fault as it is hers, you know? Right. Um, right. So that, that was really important to me, I think. And then showing the effect of the empire, because again, we're talking about the time period between the two trilogies. So seeing, you know, what would the emperor be, the empire be doing? Um, 
you know, so the idea that once Vader has kind of wiped out the Wookiee rebellion or resistance on and killed the Jedi there protecting the Wookiees, you know, the Empire can move in and start enslaving them and they're using them to build other, you know, weapons of war, right? Build the Death Star or whatever. And then, you know, the same with Raxus Prime, right? You know, you, you, you take out the Jedi who's kind of the guardian of that planet and now the Empire can move in and start building a... Um, uh, an imperial weapons factory there, right? And I think some of it also, and this was not originally planned, but as the story evolved and it all came together, it all tied back into the, you know, emperor's um, master plan, right? I mean, what you find out is that a lot of this is being driven by the emperor to begin with, you know? Right. Uh, and so, you know, then you have to ask yourself, well, did, you know, did he, did he send, you know, did he tell Vader to send the apprentice to Raxus Prime to wipe out, you know, Kasdan so that they could go in and turn it into an Imperial, you know, facility, right? Right, right. He, he certainly best. couldn't with the Jedi, even if, even a mad Jedi protecting the, uh, the planet. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I do love this, this scene quite a bit. I, um, this was a huge cinematic. Yeah, this is the, uh, the, the first picture. Right. I remember when all the elements came in for this, the, you know, the performances, the final render, the, you know, uh, we, we walked fully at Skywalker, all the sound design, everything. We had such a large crew working on all this stuff, the rendering frame by frame out of the Xbox, like, you know, and then one of my favorite memories, Hayden, is playing these mixes back for you um, when it was done. Because you know, when you work in audio, it's like you get to you get to put the icing on the cake, and you're basically the final touch on on just thousands of hours from really talented, hardworking individuals. You know, putting yeah. something together, and and it's just it's so fun to watch something pop off the screen. And this cinematic is one of my favorite ones in the entire game. And I got to work with my favorite actor in this scene, which was great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we need to talk about your comments. I would destroy you both. I, you know what, you did give me a little help in this game sound-wise, remember? Like, I couldn't yeah. quite do the Emperor. But to be fair, you, do, you don't need it anymore. I mean, I, I did kind of pitch and form and shift your voice. Actually, it wasn't pitch shifting, it was form and shifting. So it's got, it's got a, um, a little bit of a gravel. A little gravel. Oh, and there is a little pitch on it too, but part of that was also just to distinguish you between Star Killer, Star Killer because you're literally going back and forth in the same scene. <laughs> this smirk I grabbed from one of your efforts, and I just cut it in because a lot of times, you know, the animators would do something, and I was just like mining all of the the different, um, you know, different recordings that we had done, and just kind of cutting stuff in at, at random. And um, yeah, this all turned out really, really well. The cinematic effort. For everyone who's just joined the stream, by the way, we've got uh, writer and project lead of Star Wars The Force Unleashed, Hayden Blackman. Hayden Blackman is here on in the, line. the house. And we promised to get to questions, so if you've got questions, go ahead and put them in the, uh, yeah, um, in the, in the cascade here, and we'll pull them out. Indeed. Indeed. Is I this will, the right mouse, or is that the right mouse? That's the right mouse for that. You you can keep an eye on that. Okay. I will keep an eye on this, and, okay. and we'll get through this. I swear to God, we'll okay. get through this. Jack Fletcher, so, thank you so much for modding. Uh, Hayden, you were going to say? Yeah, one question that I've seen come up a couple times, which is a pretty simple one to answer, is why does uh, Star Killer hold his lightsaber backwards like that? Um, and this really was, you know, we from day one wanted people to look at the game and know that uh, it was the Force Unleashed, right? And so if you saw a screenshot of the game anywhere, you would know that that was it. And, and we'd never seen a, a Jedi really hold his lightsaber that way. And, you know, for us, it's like, well you're going to be looking at the back of the character all the time. We want to make it as interesting as possible. And we know that every screenshot, you know, will have him with the lightsaber like that. And it will be instantly recognizable what it is. I remember cause you, you, you were on uh, Jedi starfighter, right? Yeah. And in Jedi starfighter. Um, oh my gosh. I'm blanking on her name. The Jedi master and Jedi starfighter. Addie, Addie Gallia. Addie Gallia. She was holding her lightsaber that way in the cinema. I mean, it wasn't a lightsaber game, right? So camera wasn't an right. issue, but in the cinematics, she was holding it that way. And I think Jedi power battles featured one. And then of course, Ahsoka ended up. Oh doing yeah. The same that, thing. Maybe, Tano, yeah. Which I thought was interesting because Ahsoka and Starkiller were trained by the same guy and, and were conceived of at the same time. Mind blow. Yeah. You heard it here. Oh, can I tell a funny story about this lightsaber thing? So I remember you got the gig shooting The Mist with Frank Darabont, that that movie from 2000, I guess it was 2008, but you shot it in 2007. That's right. And it might have come out that fall or it might have come out in 2008, I don't remember, but I remember going to see it with you. And at one point, your character, 
is is, ho- is going knife. through is is given a knife and is yeah. going through a um, uh, like a broken down convenient an old convenience store or something like that. Yeah. To get supplies and you held the knife backwards, backwards. the way because you had literally you literally flew from San Francisco to <clears> wherever <throat> you guys shot that Shreveport, somewhere. Yeah. Shre- yeah. Yeah. And uh, and you were holding it that way as almost like a wink to the to the TFU team. Wink. Yeah, I was told. Um, so if you go and watch uh, the mist and Sam's in it, you watch him hold his knife backwards the way that Star Killer holds his saber. Well, I, um, I as a little bit of an Easter egg to the development team. That like, was really cool. And like the egotistical jerk that I am, I did the same thing in Being Human. Uh, there's a point in season two where I fighting some vampires i get a steak from one of them and then another one's coming at me and i grab his steak and i have two steaks and, I, and the force was, unleashed two the camera was behind me so i made sure to stand and give, give a force unleashed two i did not know Stance, that yeah I'm oh that's awesome. an idiot i'm a real idiot. that's hilarious i let's see yeah, let me go through see if i can find some other questions here i knew you were still trying to kill me to space with you goodbye Yeah, I remember too, Hayden, with Proxy, the the plot changed because at one point there was a huge battle on Raxus with the core of the planet. The core, right, the computer core. Yeah. And, of Raxus yeah. Prime. and we just simplified it into that battle that you talked about, <clears throat> the Darth, you know, the Darth Maul uh, battle. Can you talk a little bit about that decision? Because I remember when that happened and we jumped into the studio to record it. I, of course, was thrilled. Um, and I'm still very glad I got the opportunity to play Proxy. And, um, yeah, I think that the lot, and I think some of it still survived in the final game, but the logic there was that the planet itself had driven um, Proxy insane, right? Even more so than he already was, maybe, right? Look at this poor right. guy. <laughs> um, Sorry, that's awesome. So, yeah, so he it, it drove him insane, and he, you know, goes out hunting you um, as per his primary programming, right? But then we did, and can't remember how much of it survived in the final game, but we did have the the core was of the planet was talking through him at one point. Um, yeah, that, then, none uh, of that's there anymore. I remember recording that stuff with you, but it's right. I'm pretty sure we we uh, we redid it all because I remember at one yeah. point trying to figure out how Proxy would sound like the core and were we going to mix right. two actors and and uh, and all of that kind of stuff. But instead, we got that really cool fight and. It's funny how it was almost just a happy accident because it simplified production and also, I think gave gave that character a really great uh, arc as well. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that. I mean, the at the end of the day, you know, uh, while production realities I think always come into play, I always try and approach it like what's going to make the game stronger, right? So we, you know, I think streamlining a lot of that um, really helped. Uh, because it got really confusing with this third, you know, you're fighting the Empire and, I, and Proxy, and now you got this third thing with the core, and you know, um, and I think it made it, you know, just too confusing, and it was too much to try and convey as the players running around Raxus, you know, right. killing stormtroopers. I remember also being in the studio with you saying, you know, take the, take this sort of like cocked eyebrow raise, uh, evil, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna get you, kind of like HK47 uh, out of it. And make yes. him really, really playful and naive. Yeah, he is. Yes. Really, the, the um, and I remember you're saying, this is the concept, this is the concept. <clears throat> and, you know, the script, it's funny because in the script, he's saying these really messed up things. So your first reaction is to give it some to, malice. Just a little bit. And, and I wasn't doing much. And he's just like, no, no. And I remember you saying, go exactly the other way. Yeah. Completely the other way to the point where. And, and I remember, you know, this, I remember doing that at the table read a little bit, but like, you know, it, at, at some point I feel like we were trying on a lot of different things for, for proxy. I know there were a lot of auditions we collected as well. And, and, um, it all ended up kind of coming back to that same innocence of like, I'm sorry, I killed, I tried to kill you, but I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I tried to kill you. You know, well, um, I'm this sorry idea. I failed. It's I'm sorry that yeah, I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. No, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry yeah. I failed. I'm sorry I didn't kill you because I don't understand death Which, clearly. Which, by the way, is such a grim thing that proxy your your best friend thinks he'd be doing you a favor by killing you. Well, he's a he's yeah. a machine. A, he doesn't understand that. Well, there's you know. that, but I'm I'm saying like what that says about the life of a Sith. Your best friend's like, man, if I could kill you, that would be great for you. Yeah, and it's You're so different. A terrible life. You to know? this it's... day, is still so different than all the other oh, sort yeah. of dark side or dark Imperial droids that we've seen. Even yes. K two S O, very different than that. Different than K two S O. I, mean, I, I really had a, and I think that in some ways, as I was writing it, um, I tried to just channel the kid, right? Like we did not, we knew we didn't want him to be three PO, right? And it's so easy to write a droid, in Star Wars, it ends up yeah. sounding like. 3PO, you know, 
So we really wanted to avoid that. And then obviously there's HK 47 to, you know, worry about where you've got that, you know, he's a great character, right? But yeah. they've already done that kind of sinister, right. you know, Spain. assassin, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So I really, I tried to approach it as he's a, he's almost a child and that his yeah. primary programming is to kill you. You know, Vader's given him that. Um, and he just wants, he wants to make, you know, he wants to make Starkiller proud. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> not yeah. not realizing that by you know by killing it, it in order to make him proud in his yeah. mind he's got to kill him not realizing what that would mean right yeah exactly um, and then he's programmed yeah. to kill but was never actually given any sort of parameters for what death actually is so yeah he doesn't, yeah, wor he he doesn't no worry concept, about it right? doesn't know. you know if anything it's like he's programmed to feel like if i don't do this i'm letting down the team Mm -hmm. yeah. But another thing I love about Proxy is that he goes, accessing Imperial Records, and he just pulls up, you know, a profile of Juno. And then you go and watch Rogue One, and you watch these people struggle so hard to, like, find one data disk. And Proxy's just like a walking data bank, or, you know, or if anything, he's like Vader, you know, you could argue he's Vader's sort of backdoor hacked access to Imperial Records just walking around. Like, oh, yeah, I'll sure I'll pull that up. and. Pull up General Coda, no problem. Pull up the Death you know, Star plans. Pull up the Death oh, and, like, and that's the funny Why thing, not? right? Is like, you know, you look at Rogue One and like it's all about grabbing this physical media and this this um, uh, this planetary shield and you know, and Proxy's just like doop doop doop, here you go. Well you know. Which actually you could well, argue yeah, makes sense Empire, for Vader. For the Empire, they had access to all that. For the for the rebellion or or, or for uh, yeah, for the, the, the rebels in Rogue One, they don't have access to any of that. They, yeah. they don't know where to look for but it. But I would even say with the Empire, it was protected. And I think this idea that Vader, you know, uh, has his own access, of course, or would create his own access is, is actually a, a, a great argument. You know, this is Black Ops, after all. And that's another thing I loved about it. The Rogue Shadow, uh, you know, you know, this is something that no one's supposed to talk about. Uh, yeah. Nobody knows that Vader, um, you know, is... is uh, is doing this and one of my favorite um conceits that you came up with hayden was how come we're battling both stormtroopers and proto rebels in this first Why? level yeah you know and of course it's a gameplay thing because it's fun but the way that you justified it in the story was no witnesses, no witnesses right no one yeah. can know you survive so can you talk about kind of coming up with that idea and uh was it the gameplay that drove it i always assumed it was uh it was actually both i mean there was one of those good great moments where um, you know, the, the gameplay and the narrative kind of come together. Oh, God, I love this section here with the carbon freezing. Anyway, yeah. um, oh, it was just, <laughs> it was one of those great moments where, um, you know, gameplay and narrative kind of came together and, and worked well together. We knew from very early on, we wanted you fighting stormtroopers because they're fun to fight, right? And they're, um, and, and to be honest, we were a little bit worried too, what players would think and, and how they would feel about, going into a game where, you know, the first couple of levels, all they're doing is killing rebels, right? There's obviously nothing kind of heroic about that. Um, I mean, and we, we debated and wrestled even with the opening of the game with Vader killing Wookiees, you know, there's everybody's got a soft spot for Wookiees and, you know, I was gonna turn players off if they spent the first 20 minutes murdering Wookiees, right? Um, did we get so any, did you, did we get any focus test discussion. feedback on that? Or was there any feedback or, you know, ultimately when the game came out about that? No, it wasn't. You know, everybody loved playing Vader. Well, there you go. Um, and, and I think the thing that, and this is actually another funny part about that story, is that, you know, there's always this kind of, you get into these weird kind of uh, almost religious wars on, on in game development sometimes where people feel so strongly about a specific game design philosophy. And there's, there's kind of two schools of thought um, with an opening to the game that like we did where, you know, one school, which was, you know, where I fell, which is, you want to give the player a taste of what's to come, right? So <clears throat> by giving him Darth Vader to play in the beginning of the game, or giving the player Darth Vader to play in the beginning of the game, you give them a a kind of glimpse of what they will become ultimately, you know, uh, later in the game. And in fact, there's a point in the game, you know, probably halfway through, where you're like, "Wow, I'm more powerful than I was even as Vader at the beginning of the game." Um, then there's the flip side to that, which is, but you know, you never want to take anything away from the player. You never want to give them something than take it away. And so there were lots of debates around that. And I think we were more, ultimately, we were more concerned about that, that players were going to be angry, that they were given all this power at the beginning of the game, and then we strip it away because the princess starts out nowhere near as powerful. Um, and then, again, at the end of the day, it turned out to be a non-issue. People loved playing as Vader, but then they got engaged in who the apprentice was, and you're leveling up pretty quickly, and... There's stuff the apprentice can do even early on that Vader couldn't. Well, you know, there's, uh, I, I gotta say, I think the fact that 
from a story point that it's Vader, people will give it to you. But oh. the, other, the other thing that worked for me as a, as a player <clears throat> was that Vader walks, which is what Vader does. He strides. He's these huge, powerful warrior strides. But he's not in a hurry to get to the next it's spot. Star Killer you know? so fast. And start yeah. right. So you, in a weird way, you you do get a capability in just the fact that you were running around and the gameplay pace has picked up like by a lot, right? So you're Vader, right. you're methodical, and you're just cutting through Wookies. Then Star Killer is running around, just doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, Speaking I thought that of, was a nice pace change. You're, yeah. You know, that reminds me of another question I had for you, Hayden, which was I remember there being debate about the speed of the game because. The faster the character moves, the more amazing art you're going by in like two seconds. You're just yep. breezing past. Can you yep. talk about sort of the back and forth you had with design about how to pace Starkiller? Yeah, it actually it impacts a lot of different things, right? So the art is a big one where, you know, you've got artists saying, you know, I'm spending all this time building this amazing art and yet you're zooming through it really quickly. And one of the ways we resolved that was... Um, you know, by, um, again, having more arena battles, right? So, like, this space that you're in right now, you know, there's going to be enemies coming at you for a while, and we we know you're going to be spending a lot of time in this space. Um, but then sometimes you just got to go, yeah, that's the, you know, that's the price of admission, right, is that we have to build beautiful-looking art, and the player can choose to stop and look at it if he wants, but at the end of the day, it's a game, and, and we need to do what's going to be the most fun. Um, the other area where it had a huge effect, and I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but is just on the enemies, Mm -hmm. um, that you're building, right? So, you know, creating enemies that could keep up with the main character was really challenging, especially when you can do things like, you know, use force group to grab them and throw them around. Um, so we did things like a lot of our area effect attacks. Um, I think this thing that you're going to fight on the platform here has the ability to th yeah, throw stuff at you and, and, you know, catch you in explosions. Um, this is actually watching this cloud city battle. This was actually one of the hardest fights in the game. Um, and I would bet, at the time, we didn't have a lot of the telemetry data that, you know, modern games have where we can kind of monitor where people, you know, kind of um, die and how, you know, how many enemies they kill and all that. But I would I would guarantee that player death spike here because this is one of the harder fights in the game. And a lot of it is because we introduced new enemy units that could start to counter that speed that, that Starkiller had. That's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, but it's a con I mean it's a constant struggle right because you want the character to feel like a superhero but yet you also need to be challenged and I would even argue that you know in hindsight I think the game's too easy in some regards because and it goes back to the conversation we were having much earlier but the player is not always encouraged to use his force powers right because he can you know hack through so many enemies with the lightsaber um, so you know again if I can go back and do it again I would certainly make the the kind of normal mode a little bit more challenging just because then the player's forced to experiment um, and see the breadth of, of what you can do and, and the game becomes less repetitive as a result. Uh, there was a great question on here. Um, are there any fun Easter eggs in the game that are hard to spot? Um, there's a handful, you know, it was it's, it's interesting because you, you always want to put Easter eggs in, but at the same time, it's like, you know, the time that you spend putting Easter eggs in, it's time you could spend building other content. Um, I think the one that I remember the most is actually back in the Jedi, or sorry, in the TIE Fighter factory. Uh, one of our artists, Carl Wattenberg, who had worked on Republic Commando, slipped um, one of the um, uh, commando helmets uh, up on a ledge that you can find. Right, in the it's construction facility. Well, wasn't that just in the demo? I, th I didn't know if that that was in the actual game. Uh, I think I think it made it into the final game. Um, so that, that was one... Uh, that Obviously, think, Jar Jar yeah. and Carbonite and all the Easter eggs in, uh, right, Jar Jar and in Stern's yeah. uh, collection. Yeah, and that's the other big one, right? And some of that was we were using mm -hmm. other assets. But, um, yeah, there's a ton of stuff hidden in Stern's kind of hunting lodge um, that I think are Easter eggs. Um, I don't think stuffy. we – I'm trying to remember. Uh, I don't think we slipped in a, a reference to, you know, indie, which we do in a lot of other – you know, which we tried to do in other games. Um, or Sam and Max or things like that. Some of the kind of historically, the, the traditional LucasArts Easter eggs. Um, I don't think we got around to ever doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think Stearns is probably the best example. And for Clone Wars fans, uh, Ozzy Stern actually is Tom Kane, the voice of Yoda and Admiral Yularen, yeah. and and that model actually is his face. His eye color it's is different, face. but yeah, that yeah, is different eyes. that is actually voice actor Tom Kane who came in and 
and did the likeness capture. I don't think he did mocap, but he did the likeness capture, and then he did the voiceover, and then uh, it was kind of animated on that model. I believe that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's... You know, I think <clears throat> for me, the, the what was more important than even Easter eggs for me was the idea that for Star Wars fans, we could plant all these little clues to, you know, kind of the how the universe has evolved and, and, you know, tying things together. I think somebody asked this question on the stream already, but, you know, we, we put a lot of effort into the design of the stormtroopers um, in that opening level with Vader to show the evolution from the clone troopers to the stormtroopers we know and kind of, yeah. yeah, with the helmets in particular. And then even to your, your question earlier on Raxus Prime, you know, there's a bunch of vehicles hidden throughout Raxus Prime, but it's to show that, you know, some of these things, like the the Trade Federation, there's a there's a couple of Trade Federation vehicles hidden around the uh, around Raxus Prime. And those were, again, meant to kind of show that, yeah, the Trade Federation has been wiped out and they're just junk now, right? They're just, they've been shipped off to this, you know, kind of junk world planet. Um, Felucia as then, well. There's that great uh, Clone Wars yeah. graveyard on Felucia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then even little things like, um, well, they were big things, I guess, from a kind of creation standpoint, but showing, you know, Darth Vader's starship, the executor, is under construction, right? So right. seeing it being built, I think, is for hardcore fans is super cool. Yeah. Having Princess Leia as a young woman, um, and then obviously the big reveal at the end of the, you know, what what is the Rebel symbol? You know, the, we're much more focused on that. I love this scene too, the going into the, the hut. Um, skip he totally he skipped past like it. A, like a jerk, <laughs> like a real jerk. Like a, and no, they get to the important stuff, the flamethrowers. Yeah. And, and then the first script, his name was very different than what it turned out to That's be. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, I don't know how much we can talk about that. I think, um, you know, for I've, me... I've already talked about it, so... Oh, okay. So for it. me, what was interesting is he was always Starkiller, right? From day one, he was... We wanted him to be... Regardless of what his original name was, whatever his, his kind of, you know, his given name was, by the time you meet him, he spent so many years under Vader's thumb that he's Starkiller, and that's what he knows himself is. That's what every... Or as... That's what everybody calls him. Um, there's no, you know, uh, in his mind, there is no other identity, right? And so we had a name for him um, that we liked because it was, you know, an easy to remember name, an easy to spell name, a name that had kind of mythic qualities to it. Um, that would be his real name that he would discover. Um, and somewhere along the way that got nixed um, and the uh, uh, licensing came up with, you know, uh, his, his official name, which... I don't even like I, don't, I I have to be reminded of what it was because we literally never used it in the script and I right you know, so Alex started, Murphy I think Alex Murphy I think it's it was Sam there was a scene in the end where he goes what's your name son and Stark kind of goes Murphy yeah <laughs> sorry it's uh, Galen Merrick is the, is the Galen name. Merrick yeah, is the name I'm I, having yeah. trouble um, I'm having trouble um yeah. uh, we did have a question about uh, the planet Haroon do you remember this. Talking about yeah, yes, actually I the do. cut level because um, I think we brought it up in one. It of the took last me a streams. minute to remember it. Um, it was a crystal. Was it, it the crystal planet? It was the crystal planet. Yeah. yeah. So the idea there was um, we wanted to send you. So before we had the um, the starfighter, or sorry, the star destroyer factory, we had this idea that your major blow against the empire was going to be destroying their crystal facility crystal mining facility on this planet Haroon, which I believe is part of the, was it part of the expanded universe already? That that's where the, the empire was getting crystals to power the Death Star. And so you don't know as the, the you know, the apprentice, the player doesn't know that that's what yeah. they're using. Right. I mean, well, and now it's now, I mean, it's, it's different now. It's, they're using yeah. fiber crystals from, you know, that they got from, uh, Haroon. you know, from Haroon. Right, right. So yeah. this was all, this was back for the, you know, the determination of what was canon and what's not, right? So in, in in our, you know, whatever, in our research, we had found that they were mining off of some planet. Not the Accordions. Um, and that they were shipping these crystals over to the Death Star to uh, power the super laser. Um, so we were going to have you go to this crystal planet. And it actually was, the, the way that it was going to play out was really similar to what we ultimately did with Raxus Prime. So that, you know, you would get there, Proxy would still disappear and try and ambush you there. It's obviously a huge Imperial presence. Um, the difference is, is that we were going to have all these giant crystals that were going to be DMM showcases that you could, you know. Ooh, that would have been pretty, right? That, yeah. Crystals. 
smashing crystals as you're going around there and using them as amplifiers. We had done some prototyping of that too, that you could shoot force lightning through them and then they would kind of chain and become these big giant amplifiers. Um, I don't think we actually ever built any real art assets for it, but then when it came time to, you know, the production reality set in and we figured out how many planets we could actually build, we decided that we would set, you know, that whole sequence on Rax's Prime again and this, you know, um, Imperial um, uh, Star Destroyer facility. Um, and then the, the Star Destroyer crash and all that stuff would still, would still happen there. The other interesting thing about that is that at one point in the game design, we actually allowed the player to choose which of the there were two or three things he could do at any given time so you could go you know to rax's prime and, and take out the star destroyer facility or you could go you know rescue bail organa on um uh on uh, uh felucia um and so there was a little bit of branching there and we had ideas about how that would have you know if you went to felucia first you'd have information from bail organa about the star destroyer facility you wouldn't have otherwise but they might know you're coming so that it would be a little bit more difficult and you know, vice versa, um, that there would be things you would learn on Rax's Prime that would help you out on Felucia, but they would know you were coming and that they, they would be prepared for you. So, uh, and again, ultimately we decided to cut that because we wanted the story to be, uh, it would be stronger if it was more linear because we would know exactly what the, you know, the player character has gone through uh, at each moment in the game. We have a question about um... We had a question actually about the musical score, yeah, which um, which is just awesome. Mark Risky and yes. uh, Jesse Harlan wrote the main theme, and Jesse, who also voices the uh, Jawas that you uh, use as power pellets. That's right. I um, forgot about that. Um, and uh, yeah, the musical score was was interesting because you know we we knew we wanted um, original Star Wars music, but also original you know wanted to use the um, Star Wars uh, film from the movies that everybody knows and like so I remember we had to record the musical score really early on in the game because there was the schedule that was on paper and there was the schedule that we were all starting to get the sinking feeling was actually going to be reality <laughs> but yeah. we couldn't quite commit to it yet and so we actually recorded the score really early on on Force Unleashed we recorded the score in November of 2007 and we didn't finish production until May of 08 I think right um, but yeah, that came together. It was an incredible job. I, um, I remember, you know, Mark had to mock everything up with MIDI samples and send it to us for approval. And, like, I actually remember that process being pretty smooth, um, sending stuff to you, Hayden, in the feedback loop, and Mark was great. Uh, I remember there were members of the team, though. I played some, some of the MIDI uh, mock-ups for people on, in a team meeting try, and saying, this is not going to be what the quality is. This is just a mock-up of musical content. And I think I overestimated the ability for... Uh, you know, everyone to kind of see through that because I knew what it was ultimately going to sound like, and I know you did, but yeah. I think people thought we were going to have this kind of cheesy MIDI like N64 original music right. next to John Williams. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, and no matter how much I tried to explain, and Mark does a great job mocking stuff up, but like, as, no matter how much I tried to explain, we actually ended up having to put together a video which is on YouTube to this day called TFU Scoring um that somebody put up of um of the scoring sessions because like we had a full what like almost 80 piece orchestra at skywalker sound yeah and it just it and then jesse's job was to put it all in a blender and basically make it sound like star wars and layer and layer and layer with original john williams and um, what do you remember about that approval process and talking to mark about the creative uh challenges on the score you know, I remember it, it being actually pretty smooth, you know, and I think what was interesting about it is I don't think we'd ever done anything that complicated before on a musical standpoint, right? We had never done a big orchestra like that or anything, right? We, we had, well, we didn't on Republic Commando, but Mark had done an orchestra on KOTOR 2. Oh, right. The okay. first okay. ever orchestra, live orchestra recording we ever did at LucasArts was in 2003 for Indiana Jones and the... Emperor's Tomb. Emperor's Tomb. That's and that right. was Clint Bajakian's score. Yeah. yeah, but but this was still Clint Bajakian who did Tie Fighter, right? Did he yeah, I mean Clint did a ton of uh, Outlaws. You know, um, right. he did a ton of stuff. Who was, by the way, did Monkey I, Island? When when I first came to LucasArts, when you gave me the tour of the original building that was near, uh, that was in San Rafael, yeah. near mm -hmm. the ranch. Yeah. Um, was it Mark Grisky that I met when I was bitching about the misquote of the fourth? Stage? It was. Was that Mark Grisky? It was. Yeah. Okay. So, and he so, wasn't the guy who executed that. No, no, was, no, no. That was. I, I came in being all, I was angry. 
Yeah, no, that was. Uh, man. I won't even say who it was, but it was for a totally different game. For a totally many years prior. Game. Yeah. Someone. Okay, let's let's just little side note. We go off on these tangents. Someone did the following, right? They went yada for every instance of the Force theme in this one Star Wars game. It's always dun dun and I'm like. Ah, oh, greats! It greats because it's it's not. It's. Yeah. Classic giant John Williams interval. Yeah, it's the interval, and the interval is more is more dramatic than. And and what's what drives me crazy is some people go. Well, but you know sometimes John Williams has a different. He riffs on the themes, and so it's okay to riff on the theme. I'm like, yeah, if it's dramatic if it's more dramatic that's not a good change that's just a lame change i, I remember like wow man sam's got some ears that really bothered him really <laughs> and, well, I, and I remember mark still bugs mark was like a new employee at the time and i think was like what's wrong with that <laughs> yeah totally he was like that was uh he's like i think in mark's because mark's so laid back he's like wow that guy's intense that guy's crazy. <laughs> yeah it was a pretty smooth process though and mark was great and um mark yeah and yeah, I mean, and he, he just understood the difference between the different force themes, so it was fun. Yeah, and I remember, I remember the, um, I remember the orchestra, you know, uh, applauding him, and you can actually hear it in the video. You know, they loved the music, and you know, a lot of times they'll stomp their feet or they'll tap their bows or whatever They're when they really happy. when they like a cue after it's done. And they did that more than once when we recorded. And I think we recorded over three or four days um, on the scoring stage, uh, which is a huge treat for me because where I started as an intern, uh, 10, 10 years previ uh, prior, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to that. So anyway, um, dude, you're a nerd. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. that's feedback here. Nerd! Um, yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, so uh, I saw somebody in the, the chat here talking about these pollutions are nightmare fuel, uh, <laughs> which is exactly what we wanted like that. I got to tell you, no, no single, character in the game probably went through more concept art exploration and iteration than the than the the pollutions and particularly the unmasked pollutions from this level um just to kind of get something that we felt was alien but not too alien was scary but also you know uh you can imagine wanting to own the a action figure you know the pollutions so. were yeah they were terrifying and they had this weird kind of um I mean, the way sure. that they crawl is, it, it's very yeah. almost exorcist, yep. you know? Uh, yeah. Yes, the, 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 spider, uh, the spider walk. Yeah, yeah the when spider. they're crawling oh, yeah. all they over. They look like all their limbs are broken. Like, yeah. Yeah, and I remember it was one of the first milestones we had was Felucia, really early on. I mean, yeah. old sound engine, old everything, you know, and I remember some of the first sounds uh, that got approved for the game, too, and I was very nervous because it, it looked very good, but it was like a lot of kind of me doing my, like, death metal, like... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> German death metal. You know, it was that kind of stuff, and then I mixed it with like a, a, a really processed macaw doing this kind of like, like, it's like all this weird editorial stuff and and heavily heavily processed. But um, hey, by the way, I, you know, I know we've talked about this in other uh, dev commentaries, but since you know some people might just be watching this one, and we're going pretty, we're we're being pretty complete about it. Um, tell us about the sound engine, David. How the hell? Dude. It took it took like I remember there were like twenty people working on sound at the end of this thing, yeah. which I guess, you know, I mean, and it was a a tremendous uh, effort. This is really before the off the shelf tools were really not that they weren't stable, but they were really not proven, you know. And it was kind of like a, you know, we we had had a crack at it and it wasn't really working out. And again, new consoles, and so you know, to Hayden, to, to your credit, and to uh, everyone else, you know, when we realized it wasn't working, you know, it was a huge drama. And so we ended up taking some of the best talent in the engineering team and committing them fully to the sound engine just mere months before this game shipped. Well, for and it was like designing not just the low level, but the high level tool set as well, uh, which was a repurposed, uh, I think, VFX tool, if, you're, if I remember correctly. Well, but but to for for the layman out there, what are the challenges? Because immediately when you when you're doing a video game, I'm doing a Star Wars game, right? Yeah. When the stormtroopers shoot a gun, I want it to play that sound. And when it does this, I want it to play that sound. What are the challenges of this specific game in terms of just normal video games? Oh, yeah, sure. Triggering sounds, whatever. But this 
is a little bit different and why? Well, I think sound had the same challenge that a lot of the disciplines on the game had and uh, when it came to, to DMM, which is digital molecular matter and euphoria, and that is how do you manage assets when the infinite is possible, right? Uh, you, it, like creatively, you can, you know, in, you know, have an infinite amount of broken pieces. And, right, and the, like you, could, you can throw a tin can into a rock or you right. can break a rock apart and throw a smaller chunk of that rock right. into a... You know, yeah. Well, uh, slimy. I think dirt. what ultimately saved us was bombast and and fantasy. That Star Wars is a fantasy. It's not a sim, right? I mean, it's, you know, you like we. I remember had these conversations about well, you know, and this has nothing to do with the sound engine. This has to do with well, how are we going to do a DMM with any engine? You know, how are we going to manage assets? You know, like we talked about granular synthesis, which was kind of experimental at the time. We talked about all kinds of stuff, and I think I've covered this before, but like ultimately. The huge design of the game, that the fact that when you're bending metal, you're bending this giant warping door and, you know, huge, great sounds. And I brought on Eric Foreman from Skywalker Sound and he was giving us all this great sound work and, you know, um, and Damien Kaspauer and, uh, you know, gosh, Aaron Jonas and Rego Sin. And I mean, I can go on and on about, um, you know, who worked on this. Um, I'm forgetting all kinds of people. I'm deeply ashamed, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> he says, you know, uh, in, a, in a weird way, but um, no, but I mean, it was a lot of work, like tracking this stuff. And I remember we plotted out this matrix of how we were going to do this. Um, and it's very similar to the challenges. I think Hayden, you described of like, wow, you can tear this TIE fighter into a million pieces and you can take the ball of the TIE fighter cockpit and ram it straight into that right. door. So and how now do you that's a progression block? But what's right? that supposed to sound like? Like, here's, here's the tricky thing, even though you're saying, okay, it's, it's bombast, it's fantasy, it's not a sim. In a way, it is a sim because if I tear a, a wing off a Tie Fighter and yeah. throw it at a, a you know, a, a rock wall, on some human level, I have an expectation that's going to sound like something, right? Like I, I like it's going. I kind of know what that's going to sound like if it's a tin can or a big, you well, know. Sure, sure. I mean, you just do big cinematic Hollywood sound design. But the, the I would actually argue that the reality is is that nobody knows what that sounds like because they've right. never heard it in their life. Whereas if you were making a game that's more like a I don't know, like a heavy rain or something like that, where you know you're going through someone's kitchen. You know exactly what that sounds like. Sure. And so there's a huge amount of expectation, on, you know, on on the half of the on behalf of the players, what it's going to sound but, like, look like. But let's say I'm force bending a, a steel rod out of my way, like it's all twisted, and I go, sure. I use the force to bend it around. You know, it's like. But this is what I'm saying. The steel rods in this game were like, from space. They were not only from space, but they were like 100 feet tall. Right. So if you right, just, right. And, and so like you had this like I mean I remember like just getting these huge sounds you know the first pass on it I remember it, it was like David can you come fix this video it sounds like there's change rolling all over the floor do you remember this Hayden yeah um, because we had these little sounds out of this little library of like you know stuff getting broken and little metal pieces and it kept spamming the engine and it just sounded like crap and so it was like everything needed to be bigger than it actually was bigger 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 which is kind of what a lot of sound effects are anyway it's always bigger than life you know, the expectation of the sound of a gunshot, you know. Indiana Jones. Versus, yeah, I mean, he's got yeah. like a howitzer cannon in his hand. You know? Right. Um, and it's totally compressed. And, you know, the sound of someone getting punched in the face is not the sound of, you know, uh, a leather belt getting whipped around a tree trunk in a forest mixed with like a medicine ball and a, you know, sack of meat or whatever they use to create right. that stuff. Like, so it's just big, 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 big. And I think that that kind of saved this game because we definitely went down the rabbit hole of like how are we going to make this ultra realistic and it was kind of we kind of gave ourselves a break in realizing that like we needed to cover and we needed to make it fun but we didn't need to make it exactly what it is because I've never seen one of these machines uh, you know you know holding back a sarlacc's mouth before <laughs> like you know um, and sometimes yeah, we took, I mean we took that same approach with environment design enemy design you know VFX like we just tried to blow everything over the top, you know? Yeah, yeah, and um, and it kind of worked. And then sometimes the weirdest things, you know, there's all kinds of sound stories, like, you know, yes, the sound of the Sarlacc moaning is a pitched down baby, you know, uh, a baby, you know, laughing or moaning yeah. or playing or whatever. The, you know, the Sarlacc tendrils are like my little lean cuisine dinner one late and one night. Like <laughs> That's right, you tell the story you know, of you. you... Like, it, there's all <clears> those <throat> kind of sound stories. But everyone, yeah, everyone has those, those kind of stories. But it really was kind of the big... I mean, there's, there's so much going on in this game that's fighting for your eye and for your ear that, like, um, you end up getting away with a lot of sleight of hand, I guess is kind of the, the easiest way to say it. Right. Um, um, and I think that's true of any of any creative property. It's true of movies. It's true of games. You know, like, you're not seeing kind of what's behind the, 
the 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 camera or the, <coughs> the speakers. But so Hayden, someone had a question about the DLC, and I don't know if we're going to get to it, but I know we're we've been going for a while now. Um, but we did some pretty amazing DLC for this game. Here, I want to get us to eventually to the Death yeah. Star. Oh, you want to talk yeah. about the Death Star and then talk about the DLC? Oh no, no, talk about the DLC first. I'm just I'm yeah, trying so, to get us. So through this was really point. DLC was really interesting because. At that time, people weren't really doing a lot of it, um, and we had not never done any of it at LucasArts. Um, so, uh, actually, the creatively, it wasn't nearly as challenging as kind of just making the business case to do it, you know. Um, and once we got through that, then it was like, okay, you know, what what is creative? Where do we go from here? Given where we ended the the main game, and I think somewhere along the way, and I can't remember if it was me or somebody else that had the idea. Um, but, you know, starting with the saying that the, the kind of evil ending is the beginning of the DLC, is the launch off point for the DLC. Love that gave idea. so much latitude. It was, you know, basically became kind of a um, uh, an infinities type, you know, thing where we could do whatever we wanted, you know, and and take the, the apprentice and have him now working for the emperor and being that crazy you know, evil, uh, uh, Bosch inspired helmet. And, you know, um, so that, that to me was super exciting. And I, you know, I could have done an entire game from that standpoint. You know? Right. Yeah. It was amazing. The sort of infinities. And I remember the star Wars infinities comic books were a huge, uh, inspiration of that. Is that right? Yeah. They were massive inspiration for us there and the ability to kind of, again, go in and do the greatest hits and have you, you know, fight on Hoth and fight on Tatooine, you know, um, was really powerful for us as kind of a pitch. And then, and then beyond that, I think, you know, just from what I've heard from fans, the, you know, we, we put a lot into those DLCs from, uh, not only trying to improve the main game and, and certainly some of the work that went into DLC also helped us with force unleashed two down the line, but, um, we tried to improve the main game and then introducing things like all the new costumes and stuff like that. So, our, our attitude was if we were going to do this, we really wanted to make sure people got their, felt like they got their money's worth, you know? Right, right. And so there was that tat the great Tatooine level, and there was the yeah. Hoth level. And there was yeah. a Jedi Temple. And there was a Jedi Temple. Yeah, yeah. the Jedi Temple. Um, and I loved, well, let's go back to the, to the alternate endings, right? Because yeah. that I thought was a really interesting thing too. I mean, um, can we talk about branching story? Because at one point I remember, and this was, I almost forget this, but correct me if I'm wrong. We had a branching story at one point where do you save Juno? Do you not save Juno? That, if you right? go light That's side, right. do you go dark side? And I think all that got cut the month before we shot it. I believe yeah. that's right. But yeah. I think I read some of that in the script. Yeah, because it just became too impossible to scope, I think. But can you talk about that whole process? Yeah, what? it was. So at one point we did have, again, I said this earlier, where we allowed you to kind of make some choices about where you wanted to go next in the story. Um, that was a pretty early decision there to, to kind of streamline it and make it linear just because, again, wrapping your head around writing that story and not, not wanting to have to do two different versions of every cinematic that came after. <laughs> That's right. We were talking that, about stuff that. like that. Like, so that, that was all, I think, really smart that we did that. Um, and then at one point we got to the place where there was, I think, four different endings that you could end up with. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually... I love this shot here going into Corellia, but we actually had four, um, four different endings um, that we were kind of tracking for, for quite a while. And, and I think I even had written all, all four endings at, at one point. Um, and they really went the range from like, you know, you're a hero and you survive to, you know, you're a villain and, and um, you uh, uh, become Darth Vader's slave. And I think what felt hollow to me and, and it really got cut from my standpoint, not because of any production realities at that point. Um, but what felt hollow to me was a, a couple of the endings just didn't feel right. Like we had one where you kind of end up, you kill the emperor too, and you end up kind of on the throne of, of well, you always joke, you end up on the throne of blood, you know? And, and it's like some big, great victory for the player because he's won and he's taken over the empire. And I was like, yeah, but that's not, to me, that's just not Star Wars. Like, you, you know, if you make the wrong choice, which there's there there is a right and a wrong in Star Wars, and if you make the wrong choice, you're punished for it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so we streamlined it down to just the two endings, you know, one where he sacrifices himself and and uh, he uh, uh, 
you know, obviously becomes the inspiration for the Rebel Alliance, and then the other where he chooses revenge over, you know, saving the Rebel Alliance, and then becomes uh, the Emperor's slave, which we felt was kind of the, I, in that, the I guess the real way to distill it is that I, I always feel like in in video games that have multiple endings, you always feel like there's the right ending and the wrong endings, right? And what we wanted to, is we wanted both endings to feel like they were the the right ending based on the choice that you made, right? So if you choose to betray the rebel, or sorry, you choose to turn your back on the rebel alliance, there's only one way that can end for you, and that's you being a slave, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember, um, I remember that when you do the dark side ending, the credits would roll, and Jesse just put in, da, da, da. and it, and we, and and we never explained it, right? Like you never explained it that this was not the right ending, um, you know. So people that just played it were given zero explanation for it. You know, yeah. like, I mean, maybe you can miss the other other thing and go back and play it if you chose the light ending. It felt like you actually got the final button on the final scene yeah. and the, you know, but the other one f gave you this real feeling of foreboding like you did something right. wrong. Well, um, we gave you, <laughs> I think the thing that gave it away was we give you a, um, uh, we give you a, a badge or a um, trophy for an achievement. You get an achievement for right. being completing a bad person. Ending, right? So yeah, so you know, you know, once you got the bad ending achievement, you knew oh, there must be a good ending achievement. You know, the dark side ending and light side ending, right? Right, right. Um, and then we did, you know, we debated this long, uh, a long time too, whether or not we were going to require the player to play through the entire game again to get the other ending. And at the end of the day, we're like, no, I think, I think you just have to play from the last save uh, in order to get the other ending. That was very kind. Yeah, yeah. It was very kind of us. Yeah. Um, no, the Darth Vader. Oh, it's fighting Darth Vader. You want to talk about fighting Darth Vader? And no, to answer your question, it wasn't the wrong one. It was uh, that's that is entirely based on uh, your, 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 your point, your, point of view. Of view. That's that's of view. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's entirely basil. Yeah, no, in my mind, I feel like there's two right endings to the game because they feel yeah. you know they feel logical based on the choice that the player makes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so Vader. So this was another one. So the fight with Vader. Um, was obviously something we were building up to through, through the whole game, right? And so we waited till really late in development to start working on that fight because we wanted to take all the stuff that we had learned from all the other fights and kind of apply it to it. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways that worked, in other ways, you know, we kind of, uh, you know, almost ran out of time. We didn't have enough time to maybe do everything we wanted to do with the fight. Um, but uh, I think that the most, you know, probably the biggest challenge was figuring out what Vader was going to look like as you went through the different stages of the fight and. You know, we end up with a version of Vader that I actually, in hindsight, well, even at the time, I was really worried that, you know, uh, Lucasfilm was not going to approve because, I mean, it's, it's what is that robot chicken thing? It's, you know, the burnt bacon or whatever. You know, he looks like burnt bacon and, <laughs> and uh, as, you know, with his helmet off and all that stuff. Um, well, so was it, was it challenging to think, because, you know, we're going into this game, right? And the idea is, eventually, it's going to be a showdown with Vader. And what, how many discussions were there about like what is it? Is it satisfying to go through a whole game that's all about your relationship with Darth Vader, to not face him and not be given the chance to defeat him in battle, right? Like, and then and then how far do you go until you diminish Vader? And I know that there were also talks about, you know, especially with Force Unleashed two and Vader pretending as if oh you got me you got me and when he's allowing himself to be right. taken down allow you know cut off vader's arm he doesn't care it's not his arm you know that type of thing like did you were there a lot of discussions about how far is too far when it comes to you know smacking around darth vader yeah it was all those things right it's it's ha you know first of all we have set up an entire game where you know you're motivated to want to you know uh kick the hell out of vader, vader at the end right so how do we make sure that that is, you know, as satisfying as possible for the player. That was a, a huge conversation for us. And, you know, we were worried, could we pull it off? Um, I think at the end of the day, one of the things that we ended up, you know, settling on is that we were going to let you, you do defeat Vader, right? No matter what ending you choose, you have a fight with Vader and you defeat him. It's just whether or not you have that second, you know, even more over the top fight with him or not is up to, to, to the kind of player. And that was kind of the way that we handled it. Um, and then I think, you know, the diminishing Vader thing was really interesting to me because, and I think I've said this in other interviews before, but um, 
you know, one of the things that George said in a, uh, an early meeting with us about um, uh, about Vader is that Vader's broken, right? That, you know, Vader would have been, had he not had, you know, what happened to him, uh, uh, what was it, on Mustafar or whatever? Mustafar, not, yeah. you know, uh, If that had not happened to him, he would have been so much more powerful. And, like, that was such a, like, a new way of thinking about it. I'd never thought about it that way. I was like, no, Vader, of course, he's the most power, you know, the second most powerful force wield in the universe right now, right? Um, so we, you know, so we kind of wanted to, to bring that across okay. too and show that, you know, Vader's broken and, and, and bring that tragedy in of what he's become, this kind of Frankenstein monster, which, you know, is something I'm like, you know, Vader's a, a, a villain in many respects, but like all, every time I write Vader, I always try and, give him some humanity and i think you know i did that in both of the the purge comics i did where or all three of them you know there's a scene in one of them where vader's being basically taken apart and put back together as kind of routine maintenance now now hayden i want to i want to bring this up man <laughs> i want to because i think i put that idea in your head and i don't know if i did but i have a i have a tremendous ego so i'm going to tell the story anyway i remember sure. sitting with you in your awesome. office and we were talking about uh, the the concept of Vader being taken captive at the end of Force Unleashed right. Two, or maybe we were talking oh, right. about the possibility of where it would go in Force Unleashed Three, and I said the Rebel Alliance should disassemble him, and that's the way they keep him uh, right. under wraps. And I'm like, and how you know how interesting would that be to sort of dehumanize him by by disassembling him, uh, which now we've seen in Rogue One, and we've seen a lot of other places, and we yeah. saw in, in the comic that that you wrote. But I I remember pitching. A, a, a nightmare scene where you know the trap is sprung as they're trying to bring vader to justice and there's going to be the trial of the century they're going to put darth vader on trial and then the imperial star destroyers show up and boba fett shows up oh yeah yeah and that and that the person watching over vader with all the different components the components are all, all starting to shake and oh, yeah. start reassembling yeah, himself yeah, yeah. with the force him just going yeah, i let this happen I feel you like kidding? we were you know? all i feel like we were all like going oh yeah we could do like because i remember having this pitch too and hayden you must have gotten so tired of people pitching you stuff. Yeah, I know, it's right i remember pitching no, you no, stuff I'll, too i'll steal good ideas from anybody because uh, <laughs> I, I remember i remember going I yeah good ideas come from anywhere tf i remember thinking tfv3 you know should be like the nuremberg trials you right know? like that it should really be about you know vader as this as this ultimate villain and and um you know, but that it somehow somehow there is a, a Trojan horse, and I actually think the Trojan horse. Uh, maybe we shouldn't talk about this. I don't know, but oh, I... it's all ancient history. But you know, like proxy maybe being this sort of Trojan horse thing, you know, ultimately, and and Vader, like, and the question is, and this is the thing that, you know, you you've always been reluctant to answer, which is brilliant, which is you know, does Vader how in control is or isn't Darth Vader at any given moment with Star Killer? Like, he could still it just turn out that this is all just a ploy in order to. You know, find all the rebels, which he's. Done I remember many times. right. I remember the 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 talks being that he's, you know, you lead the player to believe that that they're in control and Force Unleashed one and two, and then you reveal in Force Unleashed three, like, nope, you nope. never were, you never were. This was just an elaborate plot again. Yeah, well, you know, but like, like I mean, certain things went wrong. I mean, if you watch the Emperor's story in the Star Wars movies and even in the Clone Wars prequels, in the prequels, yeah. things go wrong all the time, but he course corrects right. as as yeah. time goes on. So it's not like everything you did was for nothing, or that that nothing you did had any, had any uh, consequence. It certainly did, but that the enemies you were up against were formidable and that there were some moves that they were allowed to have happen so that you would have the impression that you were doing better than you were, you know? Um, right. anyway. Yeah. But, I mean, I know, you know, that everybody's, I, I, every other question on the stream is about TFU three and there's not, <laughs> you know, there's not a lot I can talk about, but not, you know, mostly because there wasn't a lot done like that, you know, there was nothing done, really. There was nothing done. I mean, you know, somebody said it was concept. There was not even any concept art that I recall ever done for for TFU three. So you know, I, I obviously had ideas about where the story could go. I think maybe I wrote up a couple plot synopses just for my own kind of you know brainstorming as we were wrapping up TFU two. But like, you know, I mean, I knew that I was leaving LucasArts to found my own studio, you know, well before we were done with TFU two. So. Um, you know, so there wasn't a lot to be honest, there wasn't a lot of work put into any kind of TFU three, um, that I'm aware of. I think that's uh, why certainly. we're so comfortable geeking out and talking about yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, it's, right. It's, we, we can talk about it. Cause I know that we had a lot of conversations about possibilities, but there and, was never yeah. anything. Yeah. Right. Sure, yeah. I mean, the, the one for me that I always remember is, is that I would have had liked to have done is, was 
and this was really where I was thinking about, again, as a studio where I wanted to push the tech and, and the game design. And, you know, had I stayed at LucasArts, the, the thing I was really pushing on, not just for TFU3, but for, you know, other titles that we were talking about as well, but was co-op gameplay. Um, and, you know, so two players playing together in a real story-driven environment. And I also wanted to build a more open world, you know, uh, a game that had, you know, more exploration to it and more uh, kind of an open world feel uh, without, you know, going whole hog there. But so the one idea that I, I had related to that was around, you know, um, Boba Fett being sent after uh, the Rogue Shadow and basically shooting it down. And then you, you literally play as Vader and the Apprentice on this planet trying to survive and get off. And they have to join forces together to, you know, kind of work their way off the planet. And obviously you never know, you know, when you can trust Vader and then you find out that, you know, Boba Fett's been sent by the Emperor to make sure that neither of them gets off the planet because the Emperor's got his own plot or whatever. But, but again, that was... That was probably the course of an afternoon that I was thinking about that, and it was all related to how do I make a cool two-player game, you know? My The the one idea that I remember, which it, I don't even know why I'm bringing this up. I remember a lot of ideas, but the one there was one provocative one that had to do with um, alternate endings. There were, there were two alternate endings to the ultimate yep. story, yeah. and it had to do with... That uh, you know, I don't know. Should I say like that? That last you you pitched me an idea of what the last level of any force maybe, on maybe this we thing. Should, maybe yeah, we, we should, should shut up. We should shut up. Back, yeah. yeah, yeah, we should just shut up. Yeah, it's cause... always you know that's the thing is like when it comes to Star Wars stuff, um, I have learned over and over again, just shut up because. <laughs> <laughs> because the idea is you never know if they resurface somewhere if <laughs> someone wants to use today. yeah i know yeah. after we've no, I know. already I, you're absolutely yeah, right. yeah i mean I'm, I'm a little bit comfortable talking about what i just did just because again that was only ever in my head i don't think i ever even put it down anywhere and, right you know, it was more of thinking about you know if i was gonna you know continue working there what where would i want to take the tag and stuff and right um you know but uh it, you know yeah who knows what they're ever going to do with this character or with this this franchise if, if anything and and like you said you know ideas get recycled all the time right? all like, the time know. all the time there could be something that comes from who knows where and uh it shows up in something important and that happens i mean again i <clears throat> i've had endless talks with dave filoni and he'll come up with something sometimes even right there <laughs> and and you go you know, you have to treat all of those conversations like they're under the strictest of NDAs because it sometimes years later that that idea is not only present but prominent. You know, and you can't you can't blow people's opportunity to tell cool stories in this universe. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm on the Death Star, dude. That was another fun thing about this is seeing like in areas of the Death Star that were kind of like, you know, like the uh, you know the the cleaning crew's lounge. You know yeah. that type of thing. <laughs> like, oh, the last people they work here. This is great. We, this is so. I don't. I don't think any other level went through as much discussion about every room and each room. Like one of our philosophies when we were building the game was we wanted we didn't want any space that just felt like a game space, right? right. We wanted every space in the entire game to have feel like it had a function and it felt like part of whatever world, whatever planet it was, and part of that natural world, right? So, you know, so the, I think the TIE Fighter Factory and this level probably went through the most discussion about like, well, okay, we know we want a space with these types of enemies and this type of combat, and we want combat to last a certain amount of time, you know, um, how, how like, you know, how, how to, but well, what does the space actually do? Like, what is its function in, you know, the fiction and as part of the Death Star? And, you know, and that got us into tons of discussions about the inner workings of the Death Star. And I had written the essential guide to weapons and technology. So I had, a, you know, some information that, you know, had that I had invented for that and that had been created elsewhere that I pulled into that. So we had a little like a starting point. But like every one of these rooms supposedly has a function, you know, and um, which I thought was really a huge challenge. But at the end of the day, makes it so much more interesting. And then. The vision for this, like every level, we tried to start with like a core central vision, like what is the big hook? And for me, this level was this freight train of the laser, so that the player's constantly thinking about, you know, when's that laser going to trigger next? 
make sure I'm not in it. How do I use it to my advantage? Um, and that that was the kind of huge hook for this this entire level. Yeah, well, it's it's uh, it's super. Wasn't there something with Tabana gas at one point too? Do you remember this? Yes. Well, we had. Um, well, I mean, we had the we had the carbonite or the carbon freezing gas, whatever that's called. The, yeah. Um, on the Cloud City platform level, right? Um, where you could freeze guys, and I think we were doing Probably. something here. At one point, I think there's there's exploding canisters and things like that at Tabana Gas. I think at one point we had prototyped again ways to enhance your force uh, lightning with things like Tabana Gas, and so like entire rooms filled with it, um, and then they would like slowly poison you over time and reduce your health. Um, I don't think any of that survived in the final game though. I am. Do uh, we want to take a look at DLC, or do we even have it? Um, Maybe we don't do we want it? Well, I have the. I have all the DLC. Do How we, are we doing on time? Are we, do we have any questions? We we still have these giveaways too. We do. We do. Hayden, can you think of a? No pressure. No pressure. Uh, well, I, we haven't thought of trivia, trivia questions, questions in um, advance. Um, TFU style trivia questions. We have these two uh, prints to give away, and uh, for the subscribers on the channel, we want to give them a chance to get this stuff um david can you think of anything because i'm i'm yeah. fighting for my life right here guys yeah this level is i can't hard. think right um, now other than what difficult uh, i'm trying to think uh, i think it's actually in a menu so it's probably too easy the one that everybody always got wrong was what's the spelling of uh what's the name of darth vader's uh lab ship that you escape from and how do you spell it but i think that's actually in the menu <laughs> It's in the menus. So it is in the menus. In the menu. So we're, we're, yeah. let's go with something that's not in the, the empirical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because it is a research vessel. It is a re yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, empirical information. Yeah, empirical data. Yeah. Empirical. Uh, that, that actually, now that I think about it, why, why not? Why couldn't that have been a question? <laughs> now it's too late. We just blew yeah, it. Now yeah, it's too yeah. late. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it's J Jack. Actually, um, what can you do? Jack Fletcher can put. Chat and sub only for that. Right, uh, Jack, if you can help us with this, this would be fantastic. While we try to figure out what the hell the questions are, because we're super organized here, we're yeah. really good at what we do. Well, this um, is some major multitasking going on here. Yeah, a little bit. A um, little bit. Yeah. Dude, the holocron stuff is always fun. Trying. Oh, oh, you know, here's something else in terms of. In terms of like, you know, I, I was thinking maybe there was a trivia question there, but in terms of like, you know, things that showed up elsewhere, dude, the dark saber shows up in Force Unleashed before it shows up in Clone Wars, which is interesting. I mean, the the effect is nearly oh, you mean the, the same. saber option, the black the, the the lightsaber saber. crystal, yeah, um, which I think is so cool. Um, okay. I've forgotten about this level completely. This level gave me nightmares. And oh, yeah. Like, How are we going to make that? You it's know? really tough. I think this is a lot of... I mean, Brian Tibbetts was like this invaluable... Uh, B-Tibbs. He ended up leading Force Unleashed 2 Audio. He was he was so good at this stuff. But I think he scripted a lot of this, these uh, moving these moving parts here. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, that was... Hey, is Mike pretty... Sanders still at ILM? I have no idea. Hmm. Industrial yeah. Light and Spencer. <laughs> I don't know if Spencer's still there either. Um, it's a good question. All right. Oh boy. Okay. We have to think of trivia questions. Hayden, in, in the meantime, uh, feel free. If anything catches your brain, I had, I had forgotten about all this core stuff. Yeah, me this too. This took a really long time for us to get working too, just because again, all the physics systems that we were wrestling with, um, in this. But yeah. Uh, I think it certainly makes it super memorable. This is ins yeah. This okay. Um, yeah. Well, see, but anyone can Google these answers. Like, well, I let them Google. Yeah, but yeah, it's right. whoever whoever right, does it I faster. Have I have a trivia question. Who, yeah, Sorry, go ahead. I think I had one too. But go, you go first, Hayden. You're... I just uh, the problem is I have to, I have to look up the answer. Um, although you guys might remember, I, I probably Ooh. know the answer. Okay, so wait, really quick, we are going for this this incredibly nice Darth Vader print. Of the man himself, uh, signed by Manny, and then me and David are going to sign it as well. So, all right, Hayden Blackman, trivia question. Uh, subs can only answer. Uh, let's do it now. The room is in subscriber only mode. Jack Fletcher, thank you very much. And Hayden Blackman, let her rip, dude. Let's do it. Yeah, who says I have a bad feeling about this in the Force Unleashed? 
Oh. Oh my God. And now I got to. Now I got to double check. No, I, 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 I know the answer. Who? Well, I can't well, say. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Skype, right, right. Skype it to me. Oh, Skype it to you. Ah, uh, yeah. however, I can't really click over just yet. But that's a really good question. Okay. There it is. Oh, I know. Yeah, right. Eisensmith's right. Yep. Eisensmith. Juno. You win. Yeah. You got the print. Juno clip says it. Congratulations. Nice. And then who says? Who says? Uh, it's. Well, is that is that the only one? It's needed? Juno. Yeah. Isn't she? Yeah, it's Juno. Yeah, she says it. I have a really bad feeling about this. Right. I got yeah. to see it. Say it in Force Unleashed too. Um, yeah, yeah. No, Juno says it there. Yeah. Um. So that's one. All right. So do we do the the next one, or do we talk a little bit more and then do the next one? We just. Let's just do that. Well, yeah, because we've, we've been going for a while. Yeah, so you're let's, right. let's do the next one. Okay, um, so this one is for the Starkiller print. Right there. Pretty awesome. This, and David, this one's much harder. Oh, you have one, Hayden? I have it. Do it. Okay. Do it. Do it. Do it. It's along the same lines, but who, who's, uh, who's the first person to say, uh, may the force be with you in um, TFU, in Force Unleashed? And I think the only person to say it, actually. Uh, and it doesn't, sorry, this person doesn't quite say force be with you, right? It says a version of it. Right? No, no. Well, may the force well, be with you. So there, there, and again, it's provided that the uh, final cinematics are still, you know, for this one is actually, uh, lined up with the shooting script. There's somebody in the shooting script that says, may the force be with you. I think, uh, someone has already answered it, but okay. can you what? see that? Can you see the chat? Is it Bail Organa? Nope. Oh, see, I was thinking, may the force be with us, or something like that. Doesn't he say that at one point? I don't remember. Maybe that's episode three. <laughs> um, I'm dying over here. What? Well, uh, I I can't verify this, Hayden. Um, who, I know, I know the answer. I'm looking at it right well, now. Well, we've got a. Okay, did someone get it first? Is it Leia? No. Hang on, I'll look at the thread, the stream, make sure. Yeah, look at the chat. Someone. I'm only saying stuff out loud that people have already guessed. Right. Oh, okay. We have Star Killer. We have Kodo. We have Bale. We have Juno. We have Proxy. Leia. Oh, I think someone just got it. Is it Shock T? Right. Shock T. Yeah. There That's it. it is. Oh, Humpty says, Dumpty says, 23. Yeah, Even though it's breath, spelled Shaka T. Yeah. Shaka Khan. It's Shaka Khan. Shock T. There it is. So, Humpty Dumpty 23. Humpty Dumpty 23. Got it. Yeah, dude. Absolutely. May the force be with you, Maris Brood. May the force be with you. Oh, dude. That's right. May the force be with you, Maris Brood. Who is Humpty uh... Dumpty 23 fell off a wall and got the right answer. That's right. And we could all put them back together again. Right? Good. Just like Vader. That's just like Darth Vader. Oh, well done. Well done. Well done. Congratulations. Those are good questions, Hayden. You, Those were good. You did it. Okay, so... Humpty Dumpty 23, um, message me on here and uh, give me your address. Same thing with Eisensmith. Uh, we can send the chat room back to non-sub mode. Jack, thank you very much as we go hunt down Darth Vader. Hayden, that was excellent, man. I, uh, You know, speaking of that, I really liked in the script the way that Vader says to the apprentice he goes remember the dark side will always be with you not, you're like yeah not be with you but be with you or no what was it <laughs> no like, there was some there was some distinction be with you no, be remember with Hayden you. you made some distinction you. about uh dark side is will, always with is you. always with you yeah. you made some very important distinction about why he says it that way do you How remember does he what, say it in the final game Remember, the dark side, will the dark dark side, side is, is always, always with you. With you. As opposed to, may the force be with you, is the dark side yeah, yeah, is yeah. always with you. And that was very specific. Be, or I wanted it to feel more... Like an albatross. Sinister. Yeah, yeah, like an albatross hanging around your neck. Something you can't escape, right? Yeah. Versus, you know, the way Obi-Wan says it in the original movie. Force be with like you. It's a, force will be with you. Right? Always. Yeah. One of my favorite memories of TFU was sitting in the room with you and I think John Stafford and maybe Cam. I can't remember, but it was really early on when you were basically getting that first uh, shooting script together. And, you know, I remember very well having this like passionate debate about Vader would or wouldn't say this. And you basically ending the entire thing with, don't tell me what Vader will or will not say. I've researched this up and down. Does he speak with contractions? Does he not speak with contractions? The answer is he does both. Like, yeah. I remember this really, you know, and that's true, right? It's like, don't. Yeah. yeah Did I, I just go backwards? You might have. 
But I don't, I don't know because I wasn't paying attention. But it's simple stuff like that that you use the character. You know, again, as I was rereading the script the other day, it's so funny because, like, Juno's, if you just read her dialogue, her dialogue feels very stilted because she hardly ever uses contractions because we wanted to have that kind of imperial, you know, that, that proper you know, that, that an Imperial would have, like almost Britishness, you know. Right. Um, and it, whereas Proxy uses them all the time because we were trying to get away from the the, the 3PO comparisons, you know. Right. Uh, but then when it comes to Vader, like, I think I people do. immediately assume, like, he's going to speak in this very proper way, and he doesn't. It's, it's, it's almost like whatever is most effective for the moment, you know. Right. Well, and this idea of like, what would he say? What's the first thing he would say? I remember having this conversation about the opening cinematic, you know, the whole right. a son and come with me more. We'll be here soon. Like all of that yeah. stuff being very like, you know, and this would all take place. I feel like in the evenings, you know, because yeah. we were just living there for right. a year and a half. Right. I remember towards the end. And, and um, uh, but those were some of the most exciting memories of all time from LucasArts is like yeah. getting to talk about this stuff, you know, and, and the origins of this character and, and uh, thank you very much for letting me be a part of that because that was a that was a huge, you know, that was huge fun. Um, well, and this is the thing too that I like. I, I just I can't ever stress it enough. Building a game is, you know, it's this massive group effort, right? Like, yeah. There's, you know, I mean, I look at even this. It's you know, the level designer on this, this guy named Steve Chin, came up right. with almost all of these puzzles, and you know, but then he had to work with the artists in order to make it believable and and. You know, then obviously the engineers contribute to it because we're dealing with all these massive physics puzzles. And it's just, and everybody, I think one of the successes of the team was that everybody was able to kind of contribute on a creative level. So that to me is one of the things that was most exciting about working on this game is that, I mean, even you, Sam, right? Like, you, you know, <laughs> no, I, I don't know that. Yeah, like, I demanded to play the emperor. <laughs> I, I contributed in all kinds of interesting ways. <laughs> but, but, even beyond, but no, but I mean, just even. The, because you were a Star Wars fan, like the late night conversations about what the game could be and should oh, yeah. be. And mm -hmm. I think all those things kind of informed what we ultimately did. And I, I so I'm really proud of that part of the, this, you know, development is that it was a collaborative effort on so many levels. And so often you hear like in game development, oh, this this game was built by this one guy. And it's like, that's all that's always, you know, total BS, right? It's a game is built by a team of really passionate, creative people. And, you know there's ideas in here that I don't know where they began or ended, you know? Um, so I, you know, so I appreciate you guys working on it because it made it a better game. I oh, appreciate that. They, you yeah. were, you were a great project lead. It was a very collaborative. Um, I just remember the whole thing being very collaborative. And I remember one of the first things I was ever told, um, this is actually by Darren Stinnett on, I think Starfighter Republic Commando is he's like, you need to be sure to achieve buy-in from your creative leads, like creative buy-in from them so that they feel a sense of ownership and agency yeah. over it. And, Every single department in this in this uh, in this game felt like, you know, it was it was their decision. Even though obviously it was it had gone through approvals and it was going through a, a singular vision of what the story is, everyone felt like you know I did that. You know, there was a really like huge sense of ownership over all of these levels by everyone on the team, and that, that's a sign of a really healthy team dynamic, I think. Yeah, there everyone was very very devoted to this in a in a yeah real god i forgot about this entire room giant i mean chamber you think about the 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 amount of work that went into this the the mm -hmm. hours and like i completely forgot it existed yeah. this was the first i think this was the first area of the death star that steve built uh if i recall correctly um and yeah we went through oh my god so many revisions on this room um and you know and he had he had the benefit of having all the different enemy types available by this point in the game you know so it's just a non-stop you know combat thing somebody asked in the thread you know was there anything that i regret not putting into tfu um you know i think there were a couple enemy units and things like that that ultimately we cut that probably would have been you know interesting to have in the game although i feel like we probably could have gotten away with fewer enemies i think the only real regret i have is that i wish that we had done we had had a little bit more time and had done more um, play testing with it and um, had had a little bit more time for bugs and bug fixing. There's a couple moments in the game that I think are spoiled by some bugs. Um, the Star Destroyer sequence, for example, uh, not everybody got it, but a handful of people got a bug with it that really kind of you know ruins that, that segment for them. Um, What's the bug? And, 
Or should I even it, ask? It had something that I, you know, I can't remember exactly what it was anymore, but it had something to do with you could, you literally could not beat a phase of it because of the way that you were grabbing the Star Destroyer. It would not work. Oh. Um, and it, yeah, so it was really bad. I mean, it was like almost a game breaking thing. And, um, and it made that fight, you could eventually win, but it made that fight, you know, three times as long as it was supposed to be and super frustrating for people. So, you know, eventually we fixed that and we patched it. And, and once we figured out it was there, but we shipped not knowing it was there. Um, it, that was a late addition so. to the game too. I remember, I remember at the yeah. very end, you yeah. know, um, people really fought so that we could have an extra, I think like two or three months of development. And, um, one of the first things that went back in was Adam Piper put in that, well, it was Piper, right? He's like, he, he, so, yeah, he mocked it up. We, so th this is another, and this is just kind of a, a key learning in game development, right? Is that we knew we wanted that crashing Star Destroyer thing from the game, from, you know, very early days, right? Yeah, it was, it was in one the trailer. Of the very first pieces of concept art we did. And that all came out of, I was in a meeting with a bunch of designers and I was really trying to push them. Like, you need to think bigger, you need to think bigger, you need to think bigger with this idea of Force Unleashed. And finally they're like, well, okay, how, how big? Like, and so, and I got, and I, to be honest, I was really frustrated, right? Because I felt like we weren't pushing you know, big enough. And I was like, you can rip a Star Destroyer out of the sky. And, and I, said, I said it in frustration, right? But like, that's how big I wanted them to think. And then I would rein them back in. Um, and Amy Beth happened to be in that meeting because we often had a concept artist in these oh meetings, God. right? And she went away and did that image. And once we saw it, we're like, well, now we have to do it. It has to be in the game because it looks oh, so awesome. Right? I'd never but heard we never that knew story. How we were going to do it. It always became this big seminal moment in the game, but we kept putting off figuring it out until you know until it was almost too late so like my big takeaway for game developers is like look you got a big moment like that like that's the first thing you got to figure out and you don't need to execute it on it right away because again the tech is still in development and you're gonna you're you know you don't want it to be the first thing you build because often the first thing you build is going to be the worst thing in the game because right. you learn stuff as you go <clears throat> but we didn't even figure out how we were going to do it until late in the game and then we had two or three different versions of it Piper's version of it, um, Adam Piper was the designer that ultimately did it. I think it was only the, maybe the second version, to be honest. And we had, we had scrapped an earlier version that wasn't as, as good. Um, and, you know, had we had more bites of the apple. And, and, you know, and again, some of it goes with the tech, too. Like, at one point, again, my vision for the game originally was it was going to be more open world than it ended up being. Um, and some of that was due to, you know, we were revving our own tech and we had tech limitations about how big we could do spaces. Um, and once we realized that, like, that you weren't just going to be able to arbitrarily pull a Star Destroyer out of the sky when it showed up, you know, we should have really dug into figuring out how to do it. So that maybe is my greatest regret about the whole game is that we didn't pull that off as well as I wish that we would have um, that moment. Uh, and then I wish we had done a little bit more in developing the relationship between Juno and, and um, The Apprentice because I think it kind of, you know, um, it evolves really quickly, you know, and I, I don't know how we would have done that, you know, through more cinematics or more VO in your ear or whatever, but there are probably opportun missed opportunities there as well. Well, part of it, you know, it's one of the things that, that David and I talk about with Force Unleashed stuff is that, like, that ba that Battle of Kalos, the way that you wrote the script, actually, it's all fleshed out. It was there. Yeah, yeah. Battle of Kalos, like that Battle really of Kalos scene, yeah, the way there, that we played there. that was very specific and, and there was a lot because the whole thing, in terms of your writing, Hayden, one of the things that, one of the reasons you write Star Wars well is that it's not too wordy. You don't have economy of word choice. Economy like, of word choice and specific lot. in the specific words that you chose and the specific lines and when they come and the rhythm of things. Um, and so that Battle of Calcine gives you that that fleshed out moment that you're that you're uh, asking for. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't get to get finished. Um, by the way, speaking of... It is in the PS2 and Wii version. And that's PSP, right. And I actually but, think it feels... And while it's good in there, you don't get the specifics of what we were putting in between the lines. Right, right. You know, which you is had, too bad. You guys got to read it together when you mo it. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, things I wanted to bring up, I wanted to talk about was uh, General Coda. Because you're talking about the Star Destroyer and the pull it out of the sky! And one of the things boy. that I... Boy! Boy! Um, crazy boy! Stay cool, boy! <laughs> um... Got a saber in, in your pocket. pocket. Turn off the juice, boy. Okay, anyway, so that was it. That was all I wanted to do. Just no, sing. okay. Right. No, um, General Coda is a unique Jedi Master, uh, the likes of which we have we had never seen up until that point and have yet to see again. Um, right. 
there have been certainly in the Clone Wars and in Rebels um, unique Jedi characters, unique characters of the Force. Um, but we've never seen um, kind of like the alcoholic football coach <laughs> of... <laughs> Of Jedi Masters, so, and I thought that was master. I thought that was so interesting, so much so that when Cully and I remember talking to you about this, when we did the first read through and Cully was doing his thing, I remember saying to David afterward, "Be like, what is he doing?" In a bad way, being like, yeah. "I don't, I don't get what he's doing," and I got it pretty quick after that. I was like, "Oh, what he's doing is super unique." Of course, I don't right. get it. I shouldn't get it right away. This is he awesome. He has a very unique line read. So you know where that all came from? So one of the very first scenes I knew I wanted in the game was the scene where the apprentice finds Coda drunk in the bar. In the bar. At the vapor um, room. Yeah. And the so vapor. a lot of a lot of the character evolved from that is that I knew that I wanted that scene. And where that came from was you know, a couple of years before I had written um, one of my first comic book gigs was um, I had written a three part limited series for Dark Horse uh, that was based around the Starfighter game. Um, and, folk, and basically was kind of bridging the gap between Starfighter 1 and Starfighter 2. And it was all focused on Nim, the, the pirate Nim, who still is one Nim. of my favorite yeah. yeah, from the planet Locke. Uh, it's probably my, Locke. maybe it's my, you know, maybe aside from some of the characters in Force Unleashed, it's probably my favorite character that I ever created for, you know, Star Wars. Great um, character. And uh, yeah, Charlie Rocket did the voice in the games. So he was amazing. Yeah. Like, he's just a really great character. But I had a scene in, in the first issue of that first limited series when I originally wrote it. Um, where one of the characters shows up and finds Nim drunk in a bar and has to kind of pull him out of that. Because I, I just love that concept of, you know, this somebody that is, again, supposed to be very heroic, but has fallen on hard times. And, and you know, and it's cliche. It's been done a thousand times before, right? But um, I loved putting that in Star Wars. And that ended up not making it into the final draft of the script. But I always, I always wanted that scene again. So I knew that I wanted the first, you know, one of the first scenes that I knew I wanted in the game was... The apprentice finding, you know, this Jedi Master, and originally it was that there wasn't. Originally it was that he knows he's got to find somebody to train him, and so he goes after this, char this you know, character that he's heard about, this um, you know, Jedi that he's heard about, expecting him to be this really, you know, um, great inspiring leader, and instead he finds this drunk Jedi, and obviously we change that to introduce Coda earlier and explain the way that he got blinded was you know because of you yeah well you know and the, what made sense for coda for me is i'm like come on I, certainly some jedi who went through the clone wars would have ended up very atypical in terms of what right. their yeah. experience was you know um and here another little tidbit coda was almost in clone wars he was almost oh, in really? clone wars. oh yes yeah. yes and also here something else nim's bomber and Nim as a character is in the uh, Fantasy Flight Games X-Wing game. I think yes. I think it's so. That's you. You've you already got about my that. bomber. That's yeah. all I care about. He, he's bomber. in. He's in. I mean, Galaxy. I worked on a game called Star Wars Galaxies, and that was a really Hell fun yeah. game to work on because a lot of my role was figuring out how do we use Star Wars and where can we? You know, we need a character to do X. Who can that be? Right. Mm -hmm. So like Nim's in. Nim is in. Uh, you know, Star Wars Galaxies too, and he's he's a mission giver in that. But oh, yeah. just, you know. Star Wars Galaxies, we've we've done a stream for Star Wars Galaxies here on Twitch. Uh, there's a bunch of, as you maybe do or do not know, there's a bunch of emulation projects to bring that game back. Yeah, and, I did uh, know about that. Yeah. And they're pretty good. Uh, SWGEMU.com is fairly damned functional. Um, I've been playing a lot in there. Anyway, Nim. Nim. Nim was great. I, the, the Starfighter, the Starfighter series, is one of the first games I ever worked on at, at Lucas Arts. Yeah. Um, first Star Wars games, and uh, yeah, I remember the Nim stuff really, really well. His Charlie Rocket, may you rest in peace. His uh, his vocal performance was incredible, and uh, yeah, what a compelling character that was. He's you yeah, know he he, awesome. he and Reddy were like the two best characters in the game. They're yeah. fantastic. So here, here's the other advice I would give to game developers, though: don't ever end a game on a cliffhanger because you. <laughs> <laughs> The, the two that I've done have yet to see a uh, follow-up, you know, so I worked on, on, you know, Jet. I worked on Starfighter and Jedi Starfighter, but right. the, you know, we ended Jedi Starfighter with that cliffhanger of what's going to happen to Reddy. Right. Uh, and obviously we ended TFU2 on a cliffhanger of what's going to happen next. And neither Republic. of those games have seen a, a third version. Of right. Republic Commando. Republic Commando. Same Commando. Thing. What, yeah. happened Republic, yeah, what happened to Seb? What happened to Seb? Yeah. That's another perfect example. So, uh, uh, yeah, so by the way, <laughs> so the, uh, my lesson there. 
the um, the same exists in television, man. Like generally, I mean, the problem is with television, they now rely on cliffhangers to get you to the next season to get you to tune in. The problem is, if your show gets canceled between seasons, you're left unresolved. You're yeah. left unresolved. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a very tricky, tricky thing that happens there. Um, so yeah, Nim. Yeah, so again, going back to you know what I would have done differently looking at the game, even watching it play now, I think that had we done a little bit more user testing, we would have been able to smooth out some of the, you know, the game can get a little repetitive, I think, in parts, and I think um, we would have been able to smooth that out. But again, I like the regrets I have are so few and far between between the, like, all the, I mean, I just even looking at these Imperial Guardsmen, I remember the first time we saw concept art for this and then building them and watching their animations come online and their AI and then the you know having the red and the black robed ones. Like every every day was just a some cool new addition to the Star Wars universe with this game. Well speaking um, of that's one of the reasons I think fans liked it. You know? Yeah, Hayden, you you came up you guys you and Cam and everyone uh, came up with some really cool backstory for these. Like for example, this guy that I'm fighting right now, uh, with his lightsaber staff um, didn't you tell me that the whole idea was some of these were lobotomized Jedi that the yeah. Emperor had converted over to a very drone-like yeah. existence so that they could they could fight kind of like a Jedi, but they weren't quite the real thing because they weren't anymore. They were yeah, messed you know, up. The, 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 I mean, just look, I, I don't know. I always find stories about inspiration interesting, so I'll share this one, and you know, your mileage may vary, but the reason where that came from... Um, do you guys remember there was that movie, The Black Hole, from... Oh, yeah. Oh, movie. yeah. Da, Hell yeah, dude. Max so there, There's really... You know, I saw it when I was pretty young, and, and that movie, you know, really had a huge impact on me in a lot of ways, partly because it was kind of it was kind of scary, right? And there's a moment where you realize that the the, all the, like, the troopers are basically, like, lobotomized drones, oh, right? Yeah. And, like, they're real people, but they've been, you know, somehow converted into this kind of zombie-like state, right? Working and at those consoles, point, you know, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't seen Invasion of the Body Snatchers or any a lot of horror movies by that point, and, and that was really impactful for me. And so that was one of the things that we always inspired me with these guys is that they're, you know, is it basically the lobotomized Jedi in the way that, you know, the, the soldiers or whatever, the, the crew in the Black Hole had been lobotomized crew members. Dude, the Black Hole, I, I almost, I recently watched that, man. I really have a... a fondness for that film I, I do too I do um too. kind of kind of a weird ending yeah. yeah they go into the black hole and i guess basically jesus bails them out <laughs> i don't know or what, something don't he know shows up he on. goes hey get out of here Let's there is i don't even remember that i remember the two droids you know and then yeah. i remember the, the lobotomy you know the, I mean, the, sh the ship itself and the lobotomy stuff you know? this is I, by I the way one of my favorite lines you are all traitors to the empire. You will be interrogated, tortured. You will give me the names of your friends and your allies. And then you would die. I remember screening. I, we put all of these cinematics together um, and screening it in the big movie theater for the team when the game was wrapped. And that line, it's fun watching your work on the big screen, but that line got a huge laugh. Big laugh. And then you will die. And then you will die. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the things there there have been a lot of emperor sound alikes, uh, and uh, for me, what I thought I was bringing to it that maybe the other emperor sound alikes hadn't was a sense of humor. Oh, why did I just skip past that? Damn it! Was bringing a sense of humor because the emperor, when things are going his way, he's a funny guy. You know, uh, uh, I'm afraid the deflect. The shield would be quite operational when your friends are right. You know, all that stuff. He's mocking. He's, he has a lot of fun. He laughs. He, you know, when he fights Yoda, it's, he's just he, he's having the best day of his life. Um, but, um, you know, and, the, and so, yeah, that, when you had that line with the Emperor saying that, I was like, oh, that's completely Palpatine because he's having a great time. Things are going well. It's a good day at the office. So I would say that that was another, you know, takeaways I had from uh, the, the meetings we did have with George around this and storytelling and games in general. But one of the things he said that always stuck with me was that, you know, comedy is important, right? Like you, you want a universe, you know, the way I translated that is that you want a universe worth saving, right? And nobody wants to save a universe that doesn't have some, you know, hope and levity and laughter in it, right? Um, and so we did try, like as dark as this story is, we did try and infuse moments of, of humor in there, but 
but my goal was to make sure it felt like Empire Strikes Back, where it was all character driven and never never slapstick, never silly, right? It was all very character driven. So you know, they're interact, and that was one of the reasons we went the way we did with Proxy, right? Because we felt like there were moments where you know you get a laugh out of some of the exchanges between Proxy and and um, The Apprentice, but it's not because they're cracking jokes. It's just because the situation is so bizarre. It's absurd, know? yeah. yeah. It's the absurdity of it. But, you know, they, they completely... They're not in on the joke. They completely no. believe it. Well, yeah. right. you know, and yeah. Which is hugely important, I think, right? Yeah. And then Coda, co- drunk Coda is funny, right? I mean, there's yeah. just no way around that. And he's, you know, I thought he was awesome. You um, put Cull- you cast Cully in Mafia 3, is that right? Yes, we did. So, That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, you can yeah, see so him cool. at the beginning of the game talking about Lincoln Clay and, and yeah. all that, which yeah, is pretty he's cool. A, uh, he's an FBI agent that's been chasing down uh, Lincoln Clay for years and has all this information about him. Um, uh, and he was great, you know, because Kay- Cully's got – he's just so good with cadence and with, um, you know, finding the kind of quirks of the character. Yeah. And so we wanted this character to feel a little quirky, um, and, and he was awesome for it. And then, you know, he looked the part everything but uh, what a tremendous guy i love cully frederickson so much he uh little little trivia with cully he was the first first contact contact vulcan he was the live long and prosper uh guy which is so cool yeah jedi and after playing force unleashed you go back and watch star trek first contact and he says that you're like oh my god general general coda (laughs) pull it out of the sky i I gotta tell you though too though we got like i mean i feel so fortunate in this cast um you know, we just saw Jimmy Smith's as Bail Organa earlier, um, and I, you know, I remember that uh, that session really, really well because, you know, we had I think we only had him in for like a day, uh, and he was working with you, um, and I had told him early on like, hey, look, for the most part, it's okay if you paraphrase things. It's okay if you, you know, like you don't have to deliver it exactly as it's been written as long as the sentiment gets across. But then there's the one line in there where he mentions the rebel Alliance. And I can't remember the exact line, but there was a way, the way that was written, it was really important that he say it that way. And so I, you know, after one of the takes, I was like, Hey, let's go over this line together and make sure we get it right. He comes out from behind the podium, comes over, puts his hand on my shoulder and goes, tell me exactly what you want. Cause I want it to be perfect for you. This is your baby. I don't want to mess it up. Right. And I was like, that was all, it was just amazing, right? Like, class it was act. Such a, like, yeah, it was so classy. And the other thing he did, which I'll never forget, is that we had done, that morning, we actually had done the likeness capture part of it where we had had his face all dotted up and, you know, he did all the expressions and we took photos of him from, you know, whatever, 800 different angles or however many we had to do to get it right. As we were leaving to go up to the actual um, sound booth to do all the, the recording, He's like, he asked, you know, oh, are we, are we leaving this area now? I was like, yeah. He's like, hang on a minute. He went back into the mocap stage and shook hands and said, thank you to everybody on the set. That's and really it cool. So, it was so classy, right? It was like these guys, you know, had dotted him up and put him through all the paces of taking the pictures and all this stuff. You know, the crew, he went in and he said, thanks to all those guys before we went upstairs. And I was like, man, like if I'm ever famous, I'm going to never forget that. Like, cause I just could like huge impact. Like, it was, yeah, it was like it was so meaningful for me and like to, to have this guy who we didn't even know if we were going to be able to get be yeah. such a cool, cool dude, you know, on, on the set and then deliver such a great performance. Um, you know, and obviously he was working with somebody that he was feeding off of. But uh, in you, Sam, but it was, well, it was who, so who didn't have the kind of class that he has, you know, because <laughs> no, I mean, that... it must have been a shock to, to work with Jimmy after working with, you know, Yahoo's like me and be like, yeah, God, so actors can be classy, too. Like, no, I mean, we sure. were really fortunate, right? <laughs> Cully, was, Cully was classy. You were classy. Uh, Natalie was great. I mean, everybody everybody that came in just wanted to do the best job possible and, and, you know, deliver for us. And there was no, you know, and we actually ran into this in some of the auditions, you know, some guys coming in and being like, oh, this is a video game? Like, you know. Well, yeah, uh-huh. and I remember because I was reading across as like Leia or Juno, a lot of people would make a lot of uncomfortable jokes. And I'm like, come on, yeah. man. I'm just reading across from you, you know. Yeah. And I even Jimmy Smith's like I, I read, you know, whoever wasn't in the room, I usually read. Right. Yeah. Uh, because there would be like Sam would be brought in for reference for Jimmy Smith's. And then, you know, and then it was Jimmy. And then I was I, either me or Dara would read everybody else. Hey, Jimmy. by the way, good ending or bad ending? Which do we go? We probably go with the good. Uh-huh. Let the fans decide. Oh, yeah. Let the fans Let- decide. Oh boy, here we go. Jack, can you put together a uh, can you put together a, a poll? We're gonna see which which version we're gonna go with: good ending or bad ending. 
Dude, do something! <laughs> Kill him. Uh, do I go here? Yeah, and then there's little things. Like, we got, you know, we we put Garmbell Lipless in here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that <laughs> was great, yeah. He, he may have been in Galaxies, I can't remember, but, you know, we had to design him, and we're like, well, what, what reference do we have? Well, he showed up in a couple comics and, and like, an old RPG supplement or whatever. So it's like, all right, here. Right. You know, I think he's got yeah. a mullet, but yeah, he's, he's <laughs> he does. He has a mullet and the, and the big mustache. But that's that's a that was at the time a canon mullet. At the time, that mullet was canon. Um, is Jack Fletcher? Can he put up a? Because uh, there's no, there's absolutely no way. I, I think mean, we're, we're getting more good. More good. Ah, we're, we're seeing like, more let's good. Let's just go with good. I'm gonna go with good. Gonna go with good. Which is attacking Vader, right? Good. No, They're it's going good. after the Emperor. Oh, it's, it's going after the Emperor. Not attacking Vader. Come on. All right. Help him, dude. <laughs> God, man. Um. Yeah, Jimmy. When when I was doing the scenes with him um, as the Emperor, um, I was very happy because after I did it, and I was you know I was walking around looking like an idiot, like doing the Emperor hands as I'm walking around the set, giving him eye line and doing the Emperor voice. Yeah, doing the hands, you know. Um, yeah. and Jimmy at some point goes while we were doing it, he goes, "Hey Sam," I'm like, "Yeah," he's like, "That's pretty good." <laughs> and that was it. It was like, hey, cool, all right, good. He's awesome. Glad he likes it. Hey, do you remember uh, who who was the? Well, I'm sure you remember Dave. Who's the voice of Leia? It's it's Cat Tabor, Cat who Tabor. is uh, Padme in the Clone Wars. That's right. Okay, cool. And, she's right. and that's why we cast her, right? Is because she was well, already. Leia she had been was. Cast? Leia was, um, as it turned out, really uh, impossible to cast, and it's hard to say so nowadays because that that's what I wanted to talk about. Because even just getting the facial likeness right. Right, was so hard, and we went through so many reviews. I mean, I don't know that any character model went under through as much scrutiny and as many revisions as as she did. At that time, um, and it was the voice too, right? Oh God, yeah. The, at that time, you know, we've had some pretty pretty great layers since then. Uh, in but Rebels, at, at the time we didn't really. But at have the time, any, it was just for whatever reason, just wasn't right. And some of the Leia's we've had since have been much more mature sounding, but this was not that Leia. This was so a- Like a 12 year old Leia, yeah. 14? 14 year old, so? like yes, needed like to have 14. this kind of adolescence and maturity at the same time. And I'll never forget reading everyone from like age 20 to literally we read some 12 year olds. And at one point, you know, and again, I was reading across from them and someone was like, you can drop the shred, Captain Stern. <laughs> da -da -da -da. And I was like, and I, and I remember Dar, again, Dar is so nice. He doesn't want to say thank you next, you know. Yeah. Um, and I remember he's like, um, try it again. He starts giving direction in the audition and I'm looking at him through the glass like, you are kidding me. Like, come on, yeah. man. Let's just say, okay, thank you and move on because we had a long day of auditions and, you know, but he was right. trying to, you know, he... I, don't, I probably would have done the same thing, honestly, because I wouldn't want anyone to yeah. feel bad. But, but reading across from her was just so, so, you know, some of these people were just, it just was wrong, you know? Like, it's hard to do that age and Leia, who is has a maturity that's way beyond her years. And yeah. so we went with Kat Tabor for a couple of reasons. One, because she's awesome, awesome and easy to work with. Two, because she was Padme uh, in the Clone Wars, and I think in the Gendy series as well. She was, yes, yeah. yeah. And yeah, three, she, she had she had the maturity, but she also sounds very young. Mm -hmm. um, right. And we actually altered her voice slightly, um, which I don't think she was a huge fan of. Sorry, Cat, if you're listening. Um, but uh, I did it just a little bit to give her a little bit more to, of a sound like Leia because she sounded really young. But her, per you can't argue with that performance. You know, it doesn't sound like Carrie Fisher. But we just, I believe, all made the conscious decision together to go, you know what? This needs to dramatically work, and uh, we're running out of time, and Kat's amazing, and it's also the same voice actor that is playing, currently playing Leia's mother. And right. we said, you know, let's, let's, uh, she sounds like this at 14, you know, and that was kind we're, of, we made landed. the choice, right? We made the choice because the choice needed, make, needed to be made. Um, yeah. And, uh, and she's just, she's great. Um, yeah, I remember that was probably the, I mean, and it was, we should have known this coming into it, but that probably was the most difficult kind of casting and, and character thing we did the entire game. But, um, yeah, you know, and then, and then from like a game development standpoint, again, if people are interested, I think I look at the characters, Kazan was probably the most difficult for us. Oh, uh, Kazan was great. That and was the late, uh, that. what's the guy's name? Kazan. He passed away. Uh, he was in Darkman with uh, Liam Neeson back in the day. Uh, what was his name? He was but great. just building that character was so challenging, um, you know, because he wasn't bipedal in the way that everybody else was. And, and so there was a lot of, you know, 
Larry Drake. A lot of challenges to that. Larry Drake. Larry Drake. Larry Drake. Larry Drake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so good. So yeah. committed. Such a such a good. I mean, he gave everything he can, and he recorded him in four hours. You know, the whole character in four hours, in and out, done. Um, it's a really good performance. Yeah. Damn our home. Yeah. Our home. home. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. You know, yeah. He gave it everything. I mean, you know, he's like veins popping out of his forehead reading. You know. That stuff is really, really good. Yeah, and, so, and there are right. others that were the reverse, right? Like Maris, I feel like, you know, we cast that really quick and easily, right? Oh yeah, you know, Adrian walked in and we were all like, "That's Maris." Mm-hmm. That's Maris, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was that was one of the easiest ones. Um, Do you remember that day? Uh, this is one of my other favorite, like, really good memories of developing the game. There was a day when we had uh, we were doing the facial likeness capture for uh, both Maris and. and um, Coley for Coda, and so we had done makeup. We brought a makeup artist down from yep. Lucasfilm to do makeup on both of them. So we had the Zabrak horns on her, and the you know, yep. um, we had Coley all done up. He had a fake goatee on and all that, and they both walked over to the team area. And I think Amy Beth, who you know had done the concept art for both these characters, just about had a heart attack seeing them. You know, so we surprised her with them. <laughs> Well, and I think this is why uh, Sam asked that question earlier, too, about being some of the first with the likeness, because I remember yeah. after we did the shoot and we were all in working on the game so many hours, anytime we walked a cast member into the team yeah. area, it was like the whole room just stopped because yeah, yeah. It, it, it was hard to fathom that yeah. these people were walking, talking people that looked exactly yeah. like these characters. And you've got people right. staring at them for, you know, at some points, you know, 100 hours a week towards the end. And then they yeah. just come walking up to your desk, going, "Hey, I'm I'm Sam," or "Hey, I'm yeah. I'm Cully." You well, know? I was method, so I had everyone refer to me as Star Killer. Right, right, right. Yeah, no. And I remember you actually having animators. <laughs> I remember animators actually asking you to do walk cycles and run cycles, like step right. and down the hall, and they'd literally. This is before iPhones were really doing that, right? So they pull out their, a camcorder or whatever and and record you. And uh, I remember Cully like showing up with baked goods at one point when we were all when the whole team was killing ourselves. Like he just said that he brought like some baked goods and. And I remember this really well, like, you know, we, a lot of these cinematics would get mixed at night, you know, and I remember you calling me, being like, how you doing, how you doing, you know, and I'm going, oh, I'm tired, I'm I tired. want to kill me, <laughs> kill me, <laughs> you know, but then I was so proud to like, I, I, I remember showing the cast the finished product, like some of the, the story beats and them just being like, we had no idea, and I think in some cases, like, Kali, like, oh, I'm so relieved, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. you know. Because we don't know what we're doing, we're just dotted up, and this is like it's so commonplace to do mocap now, you know. But back, it was back then, totally it was really, new, totally it was, new. It was new, yeah, yeah. No one knew what they were yeah. doing at the time. Well, we need to have you beat the emperor so we can wrap this up. Yeah, Hayden, or or I'll time. just I'll just. <laughs> how do you, Jeez. Hayden? What do I do, man? How do I how do I beat this guy? Uh, Run around this thing in circles. <laughs> just keep we should have picked the fight based on which one was easier. I think the Vader one's easier. Yeah. yeah, a lot of it is dodging him, and then the way that I always did it was using um, as the enemies come in, Run you away. use that uh, uh, force lightning on them to turn them into bombs, and then hurl those at the Emperor. Hurl his own dudes at him. Yeah, yeah, but so even there, when you pick up those things, I think you can. Um, I think you can pick up these things and charge them up with lightning, and then slam them to the Emperor. And then if he summons guys in, then you can use those uh, against him as well. Yeah, but he's... you're not going to do a ton of damage to him just uh, throwing things without charging him up first. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm charging him. But like the thing is, he invented force lightning, so he's like, yeah, man, not a big deal. Also, his is purple. Yep, his is purple. Mine is blue. I don't know why mine isn't purple at this point. This is going very well. Yeah, it's not going well at all, man. I don't think this is going to happen. I don't think we're going to get the final. Oh, no. So I go back. I, I, I take back what I said earlier about making the game more difficult. <laughs> yeah. Here, do I have any uh, force things that I can use to force upgrades? Upgrade yourself. Is there anything? To keep from dying. Right. Because I doesn't it, isn't there like Vitality. a level up? Combo mastery. There you go. Do I get full health? No. 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 That usually works in some games. Like that usually a, works in some when you level up you know you yeah, yeah. get your full hit points yeah I just hit him with a fully charged garbage can it did nothing to him he is deceptively spry this is rigged it's yes. rigged it's rigged yes there's gotta be like something maybe it's just you need to get near him 
you need to get yeah, going mono e mono like that's not his thing he's like dude i don't i haven't carried a lightsaber for years please. hayden where can people find you on 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 twitter it's on the bottom of the page if you look at oh, hayden Blackman. The oh there it is yep sorry yeah never mind and david w collins is there as well at so you david w collins that is me. these guys because they're great great well, it's great um is this is this it sam yeah, I think you're gonna do it. it this time. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I'm gonna do it. I'll be honest. Okay. Um, Coda is totally. You can see that he's cheering me on, but it's not working. You, you, you have to block. People are uh, screaming that in the. Uh... <laughs> I have to what? You have block to... if you can use your block. To do what exactly? To block the light. I think you can block the lightning that he channels at you potentially. I don't know, man. It's been so long since I. Uh... Played this fight. I used to be that person that remembered every single yeah, me too. thing, every line of every play that I ever did, every level of every game I ever did, every sound I ever made. And I'm finding le recently that I'm, I've either blocked it out or it's just like been shoved out of my brain for something else. But like, right. there's some stuff in here that I'm like, man, I used to know this stuff by heart. Um, up, so it down, happens, left, sure. right, A, B, A, B, start. Well, yeah, and then there's the cobwebs that never leave you like that, yeah, right? Like, like we'll right, always but... know how to cheat in Contra. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, Force Unleashed. Oh. No, you're saying I can throw his bros into him, but he's got a shield around him. So I think uh, you were lying. Yeah. And charge him up, throw him. Oh, oops. Didn't Repulse hit. does all the debris. Hold on, I'm going to start looking to our, our Greek chorus here to tell us. Yeah, what, does what it, yeah do. someone knows, right? Um... It's, it's called getting old, dude. I don't, I don't, I don't know what you mean. Um, it does have cheat codes, doesn't it? It does. I'm trying to think what are the cheat codes. The cheat code Katarn unlocks all abilities. Yeah, I saw that. I think he has all his abilities, though, at this point, doesn't yeah, he? Probably. Yeah. Or no, you actually still had some orbs to... to oh, have. no. Morgan Katarn. This dead man holds the valley's location. Hold on, I have mayonnaise on my cheek. <laughs> hey, Dave, do you remember, I mean, just talking about the game development, do you remember at one point, um, this may be before you came on, but when we had the, uh, basically the original concept was that you were going to be able to choose um, the gender of the main character? I think that was before I... No, but yeah, no, there were definitely... Well, I remember we scored a lot of videos, and yeah. sometimes they were male and sometimes they were female. Sometimes they were female, yeah. Yeah. Um, so but I don't remember the users... Oh, no, wait, I remember... It, wasn't there something in the script, too, like the early drafts? About... Not script, but the story. The early drafts of the story right. took into account whether you were male or female, and, and um, again, making allowing the player to kind of choose that. And then we also were, you know, wanted to do much more with customization in terms of defining your appearance, but all that kind of led to the female version kind of uh, was the initial inspiration for Maris, who is still, I think, you know, there's so many good characters in the game that I, I you know, loved writing, but Maris, I feel like was, again, I wish we could have done more with her because I felt like she was a really great character. Yeah, she was great. She was great. Um, and what a cool looking character. And of course, those... Uh... Um, those small lightsabers you have. What were they? Like, Tomfos. Lightsaber Tomfos. Yeah, Tomfos. Yeah. Thank you. That's what they're called. Yeah. Um, Tom Bible did a great job making the sound of those sabers. Really, like, kind of taking the original saber source material and just making them really kind of punchy and light and, and yeah. like, almost like little dragonflies flying at you. That was a really, that was a really cool thing to see that stuff come together. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest challenge of making this game, uh, though, was that, you know, I, I, I can't emphasize this enough that when you're building tools to build a game at the same time, it's it, it's like, you know, all, all these decisions you want to make about the game, you're actually spending your time building the tool to figure out how to make the first decision, let alone make the yeah. iterations, you know? Right. And um, that was, I mean, that was the, a huge challenge was, you know, trying to build a mature tool set to do, you know, stuff that had never been done before. You know, it's synonymous to, well, I want to show you this movie that I made, but I actually have to invent the projector first, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I'm going to be caught in meetings about how the projector works before I can ever figure out what, you know, the character arc of the main st of the main character is. I mean, there was a lot of that. So it was just like, I feel like we talk about tools all day and make the game all night, you know? Um, right. It's kind of how it worked. And, and um, well, even like you go back to specific examples that Raxus Prime has all those... Um, 
engine parts on the uh, on those magnetic lines mm -hmm. that you can grab and throw at enemies and you know light on uh, light up with lightning and stuff. The designer, I think Chris McGee, was the one working on that uh, the level designer. And when he pitched that, we did not have any ability to to you know put those things in the um, floating through the air. And it's it's a really pretty basic tool called a spline tool, which right. you know. You, you, you build for lots of things. We didn't even have that when he started working on Araxis Prime, even though it's a very basic tool that, you know, lots of other, you know, tool sets and, and engines would have had. But because we were starting with nothing, that's something we had to build. So every right. single idea always had to be run through the filter of, can we build this right now? And if not, what do we need in order to make it work? Yeah, I mean, we were even the simple stuff, right? I mean, to your point, like we would have to rebuild the simple, like, you know, when you're building everything and that was kind of the mandate at the time too is like hey you know we're with ilm we're you know this is a new era of lucasfilm we need to we need to be planning for the future you know so the idea was let's build the ultimate game using the ultimate tool set and it'll be all proprietary and you know for the most part there were some things that were off the shelf but yeah i mean it was yeah. it was a you know i say it with great fondness what i say it's one of the hardest things i've ever done kind of like sam playing against the emperor right now. it's one of the hardest things i've ever done uh, but i got him this time i know how to do it i figured it out myself i figured it out all by myself sam whitwer playing force unleashed using sam whitwer to battle sam whitwer. using sam whitwer tools created specifically for me to do this oh This is you, happening. He is. Uh, oh, 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 oh! It's the monolith. It's the monolith from 2001. That's right. The, That's right. No, my lightsaber. Give me my lightsaber. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Now it's on. Now it's on. Now it's on. Let him wear himself out. Back. To Do you know what this this does bring back? It brings back all those memories of you know playing through the game and through the levels and. Uh, Either the big theater or the small theater at, at Lucas Arts, and, and people cheering or booing. and cheering and yeah. Seeing, yeah, and then you know those moments of like, is this ever going to come together? Because for the longest time, you know that a battle like this, you wouldn't have, you know, the emperor would have one move, you know, and then slowly <laughs> add the others, or the enemies would come running in and do nothing because the AI was broken or their pathfinding was broken or something, you know, um, and just every you know, or the cinematics. I mean, I don't know uh, if you guys have ever talked about that, but like. That's another area where the cinematics were really challenging to produce because the engine was still being built. So anytime we made a change to the, the rendering engine, it potentially affected the cinematics. So I remember one day we came in and there was, uh, I don't think it was the kiss scene, but it was some serious scene between Juno and, and, um, uh, and Starkiller. And she had her teeth were in her eyes. So <laughs> no. So, so so she's looking at Star Killer and she looks like you know the Corinthian from uh, you know the Sandman comics or whatever. Where she's got these teeth in her eyes. It was not about good. Fuel. Not good. Yeah, it was super terrifying, and that was all because somebody had made a change to the rendering engine that had somehow you know changed the eye shader to to teeth or whatever. You know? Oh my god! As does uh, sometimes happen. Yeah. And so it, would all, it always felt like it was, you know, one step forward, two step back up until towards the very end of the game. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely, yeah, there were there were these huge moments of like, you know, the simplest thing that you take for granted now was like yeah. a huge victory at the time. Yeah. I'll see if we have any more questions. Or, or, yeah. Like, Hayden, how's your time? Because we're, we're, we've been going for a while. Yeah. Uh, it's all right. I mean, okay. wrap uh, probably in the next 15 minutes or so probably. Um, let's see if we have any questions for Hayden uh, up here. Any question? But the question on everyone's mind is, uh, was the kiss mo-capped? That's the question on everyone's mind, Sam. Was the no, kiss No, it was not. It, it was, was not. not. And I got to tell you, like, so this is a really interesting story. So we actually had, and again, you look at it today and you compare it to modern, you know, cinematics today, and it, it, it obviously, you know, is not uh, up to par with where we're at today. But at the time when the game came out, that was probably the best kiss that had ever been done in a game, <laughs> and um, it, it it's and it's really hard to do, as you can probably imagine, because you're dealing with two characters and they have to interact, and you've got to get you know the the faces have to be positioned right and the lips have to move in a you know in a, in a believable way. Um, 
we actually, when we first started doing that, we actually put some really, some of the best animators we could find on it. And it just wasn't coming together, wasn't coming together. Um, and then finally we took one of our very junior animators, um, a woman named Christine Phelan, and we said, hey, can you take a pass at this? And she did an amazing job. And that's it, you know. So again, it's like, I think us making sure that we were always trying to find the talent within our team was super important. And uh, it turned out that she just did a fantastic job with that. Um, but it was really hard. And it was probably a, the cinematic that, you know, that one moment went through so much scrutiny and, and through multiple revisions to get it right. There was a thing that was shot. Do you remember this? Because the way that the mocap worked at the time is we, we shot one person at a time, which meant that when we shot the scene, you guys had to pretend to be mm -hmm. being kissed, yeah, but yeah, one yeah. person at a time. Um, yeah, it was awkward. Yeah, uh, always I don't weird. Think it was, I, don't think, I don't think it was en ended up being used. I think it was all animated. You know, it was because... used for reference, right? Which, to be fair, a lot of our a lot of our quote unquote mocap was used for reference, um, rather than what you know we do today, where you can take you know the faces and use you know um, cameras in order to capture every movement, and then that can be digitized and essentially turned into data that drives the animations. A lot of our facial mocap stuff we did was for reference rather than driving the the animation outright, mm -hmm. uh, just because the tech wasn't there yet, you know. Right. Uh, but 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 it was the first step I think for Lucas Arts getting there, and I certainly have taken everything I've learned from that and applied it to the games going forward, and um, which is why you know I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have done this on TFU because I think the cinematics are a real highlight of, of Mafia Three, and a lot of it comes out you know as is a result of us really going all in on facial mocap. That's awesome. Let's. I mean, it's again. It's such a common thing these days. We we completely forgot. I. It's it's funny because. I don't know. I mean, like like the, uh, when I arrived on the set for like Days Gone, I think I think the Emperor just had a bug. So I'm gonna just take advantage of this right take now. Take care. Take advantage of the bug. I'm going to. Um, it's not a bug. It's a feature. It's a feature. It's a feature. Um, the Emperor is overconfident, and his overconfidence is a feature. My faith in my friends is mine. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. Well Thank you. Um, for Days Gone, um, there was some expectation because of Force Unleashed that I knew what I was doing. <laughs> and I had to sort of like, you know, be like, well, we didn't, you know, without saying that I didn't know what I was doing, I had to be like, well, we didn't quite. I mean, we did it in a different way. We, uh, you know, day. it was early. It was this and that. And, you know, a funny thing with Days Gone early is like gone. The, the tech has changed so much that it's changed several times since we've been doing days gone which is crazy when right. you consider the, like that our procedures have changed even since we started that game yeah. which was sony has half. an amazing amazing mocap crew um you know it's something that i mean i remember when we were working on this like the first uncharted came out and we we're all like oh my god that's amazing you know and then getting to actually work there for a while and work on those games you get to see like but the the sony mocap crew they're fantastic yeah, really they're fantastic. they're really great. Yeah, great guys. And yeah, they're and constantly the constantly improving the tech. I mean, if you think about this, like this game looks incredible for being almost what? ten years old. Ten, yeah, almost. It'll be uh, it's it's nine year. I'd say it's nine years old this September, right? Is that right? I think you're right. Was it 2017? Yeah, it's nine years old this September. We were we were. I was a nine year old boy. A year. That's right. No, what? what? Yes. Um, a sure. year ago, we were it, things were really heating up on this. I mean, we were working really hard. Not a year ago. So year ten ago. years ago, <laughs> now uh, we were working really hard on this, um, and we still had another um, seventy-five. Year. We still had another almost nine months of production left yeah. at this point. Uh, ten years ago, from now. Yeah, the game came out in September of eight of uh, two thousand eight, right? Yeah, and uh, George Lucas was there. That's right. That's right. Yeah. George did a lot of my mocap. <laughs> so in this scene, uh, are we going to? Are we doing? We're not doing the kiss. We are doing the kiss. So we are doing the I, kiss. I a lot of questions. Oh, okay. asking about whether or not he's a clone in uh, TFU two. What are you willing to say? Um, I mean, I'm willing to. You know, if you guys think that. Uh, I mean, look. Don't I get, say it. This is a good idea. I I don't get, do it. I get asked this all the time, my friend. Don't do it. I and I'm not even kidding you. I, I actually get asked this quite a bit. Um. I say I say I say leave it 
Leave it open. Yeah, it. I, I say don't do it because I always don't tell people. Because then you don't you won't have the ability to change your mind later. That's sure. right. If a better story presents itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, you almost see, got it. You guys almost got it out of hand. You see I, that? I'm making my, no friends my, my, today. My flip answer is it it doesn't matter, right? Because at the end of the day, the main character proves that he's he's human on some level, right? Yeah, he's star killing it in that in that story. So. Um. I, I've got the emperor, dude. He's he's mine. He's mine. I, I he's killing me slowly. Actually, this is not really going. I can't get my force power mojo back because he keeps. Oh no 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 no! <laughs> I like turning it into. No a... no no! Oh no. God no! Oh please, emperor! Here we, here we go! Here we go! Here we go! Here we go! Here we go now! Where's my oh! quick time event? Quick time event! Quick time run. event! Come on, Drew boy! Flip it, flip it. And, and juggle, there you go. And get up, get down, get up, get, get, get down. Out. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was a little bit because of a glitch, but it was also because I'm, because I'm good at. Good job. It did a good job. <clears throat> did you know that um, Days Gone was thinking about licensing my head scan from ILM? To really? save them the cost of constructing their own facial rig. Awesome. Yeah, I don't know. I would bet that it would, it's still it's so outdated. They would need to build their own. Well, yeah, they didn't. I didn't mean the game rig. They meant the ILM. Uh, oh, just sorry. the reference photos. Right? Yeah, not the rep. Well, ILM had their own like movie quality version that wasn't the game rig. Mm. Um. But I doubt they even know where that... With the Disney sale? I doubt they even know where that asset is. I was telling you a story the other day about this scene. Oh, did I? Oh, but wasn't it the no? Or was it the... No. Did I, did I tell you this story? This is I had a story about this scene where... Um, not that one. Because that one is actually from your mobile. You did that. Yeah. yeah. Really early on. Um, Sam was always blowing mics. Like, you're one of those people, there are only a few people I've ever recorded where, like, it doesn't matter if you put the pad on, doesn't matter how low you turn the mic pre down, it's going to distort at the capsule, unless you use a certain kind of microphone, you know, because you're just, you put out so much volume, it's it's incredible. Um, oh, wait, no, it's not this ending, it was the other ending. It's the other ending, ending when, when, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He realizes that Bail Organa is dead. Yeah, and you're that looking one, at all yeah. the dead bodies and you're saying, no, no, no. no. Well, we didn't have... Uh, we didn't record dialogue for that. I think it was just kind of animated and, and um, I didn't have it. So I called you and you recorded it. At my you just, apartment. You just recorded it for me. Yeah. And uh, and I cut it in. And then when it came to localization mixing, we'd already gone out and done all the localization recording. And so I had to use your no, no in every language. And fortunately, we were only localizing in... Uh, well, there's English, but what we call e figs, right? French, Italian, German, and Spanish. And no, in all of those languages except one is, is no. no, except so, German. Except German, and Nine. I got a bug. I got a bug on it, and I was like, you know, I know this is just one of those things that just is going to slip through the cracks. I mean, this is what I mean when we, we did it by the skin of our teeth. We had no time to go back and fix that and record it properly. You know, this is one of those great stories of like, this is a great scene too. Yeah, and that's uh, my mothma. That's right. I just love that shot of Vader and the looking down at the apprentice too, like that. You know, that to me just sums up Vader in this whole thing. Do you hear how carefully he said the apprentice? He'd be like looking down at the the apprentice because he almost is like, is he going to say corpse? Is he going to say body? Is he going to say living person? Is he a clone? Is he not a clone? We don't know if he survived. What are we going to do with this barely conscious person who is not not maybe dead, but maybe dead? dead Is he dead? Um, by the way, one of the cool things you can do is if you switch your Xbox over to uh, different languages, it will shift in the game. Yeah. And I always thought, I don't know that I, I approve of French Star Killer. I, I thought I didn't think that maybe he had the strongest voice. But German Star Killer and German Vader. Oh, yeah, German Vader. Who's fast as my Meister? Yeah. yeah. You know, whatever. General Kota es tot. Like, yeah. Oh, dude, it's really, awesome. It's so cool. Uh, es tot, whatever. Um, yeah, and honestly, um, Italian yeah. Italian Coda. Italian Coda is amazing. fantastic. Yeah, like, yeah, they all did a great job. But yeah, there were some that were just like, "Wow, that's amazing." Um, but uh, 
There was another story I was going to tell, and I don't remember what it is. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I still really like this ending. Yeah. yeah. The French the, the problem I have with French Star Killer is when after Vader betrays him the first time and he wakes up on the, the Hayden operating Blackman. Hayden, Hayden Blackman, Blackman Woo! Hayden Blackman um, on the screen when when he wakes up on the operating table and he goes and he gasps for air and he screams you know oh, you killed me the French guy goes like where, where I was like tearing my voice going ah you know like screaming French guy goes ah you remember that. Sort nah. of. Yeah, yeah, sort of. I'm like, oh, sort of come remember, on, yeah. man. No, it's more yeah. painful than that. Yeah. Nah. I also remember you... Um, oh, look at all these names. All these people that we all worked so hard with. I remember, yeah. Hayden, you put in kind of... I just went to go see Raiders at the Hollywood Bowl last night with live orchestra. And the whole audience always laughs when uh, Tote does that hanger gag. Mm -hmm. And you kind of put in a hanger gag, Hayden. Um, yeah, with Vader reaching down for the button on yeah. the, uh, you know, on the thing. Yeah. Marty um, Stoltz. Marty Stoltz. Uh, well, is that it? I think I think we're, I think we're wrapping, wrapping it up. Yeah. I think we're wrapping it up. Uh, I think that Hayden uh, has been very generous with his time. Yes, please. I want to thank Hayden Blackman. Dude, you you remain to be uh, one of the best writers that I've ever worked with, man. Like your your stuff is really amazing. And by the way, people, if you guys have not read Darth Vader in the Ghost Prison or played Mafia Three, go and do those things. Yeah, anything you want to plug that's your uh, beyond, yeah. beyond Mafia 3? Hey, can you guys still hear me? Because I'm yeah. Yeah. breaking up on my end. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Just in time. Oh, okay. Is there anything you want to plug? Anything that you're uh, that you're excited about that you want to tell people about? Oh, me? Mm -hmm. um, yes. No, I mean, you know, uh, just finished up Mafia 3 uh, and all the DLC for it's out now. So if you haven't played it, I think now's a good time because it's all, all there, uh, which is, you know, um, really challenging game to work on too, but I think it has a lot of the same strengths as TFU with strong story and characters. So um, other than that, I'm just you know plugging away, working on some comic book stuff. And if you follow me on uh, Twitter, then uh, I usually text updates for any of that stuff when it's available. Awesome. Cool. What about you, David? Cool. Anything going going down you want to tell people about? Uh, well, let's see. Um, at the moment, well, you can follow me on Twitter, as you can see there. Um, uh, I don't think so. Nothing I haven't said before. Uh, season 2 of Ultron. Check it out. I'm in uh, episode 6 as Commander Morvok. Uh, I did a series called Erased um, recently. What else? I'm trying to think. Oh, uh, played some characters in Mass Effect. Nothing yet. I've got a bunch of stuff that I want to talk about the next time we do this. And if we keep our um, keep things going, it'll probably be another year before we do the next <laughs> one. Right. Um, so by then, yeah, I'll have plenty of stuff that I want to talk about. But uh, right now, uh, no, not, nothing huge. I'm, st I'm just working on a bunch of stuff that I can't talk about yet. <laughs> right. Um, well, yeah. awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, right. thank you so much for joining us. Um, and for the two people that won your prints, we're going to get those out real quick. Me and David are going to sign them and send them out. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's about that's it. it. Um, oh, for those... Uh, that uh subscribed welcome um i put a tfu2 poster that has never been or that has rarely been seen before uh in there the, the sub folder by the way is just like a grab bag of interesting stuff it's like being human commentary from the actors or strange artifacts 3d vr pictures of interesting locations like lucasfilm stuff like that there's it's a pretty big i don't even know what's in there anymore there's so much stuff that's in there so Cool. If, you, if you want to subscribe, you get access to that. Um, anyway, we're going to be doing some interesting broadcasts here and there. I should have you on to do more games that you've worked on for Lucasfilm. Oh, we need to go back and finish Republic Commando. We do. Yeah. We do. Yeah. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Hayden, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for hiring me. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Hayden. Yeah. No, thank you, guys. Thanks for... Uh, thank Sam, thanks for being relentless on getting me on here. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I know my, my schedule has been crazy, but uh, I, I, I really enjoyed doing it. So hopefully everybody appreciated. Awesome. Uh, for sure. You know, the, your effort in getting getting this organized <laughs> as much as I do. Awesome. Well, we survived it. We did it. So um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Hayden. And we are out.